have now uh, bought jumpers I would never buy. That poor delusional person. <laughs> so oh, poor, we'll be talking poor, about poor, that. Sad person. £1.2 billion every year is stolen through identity theft. Are you sure someone's stolen your identity? I can approve it. I, I'll explain why. This is going to happen at about 9 o'clock. Uh, also, I want to talk about... Um, boys and they're very lost and they have no role models at all in society we talk a lot about women being mm. empowered but actually i'm very worried about young men and i've got ken uh, jolivet who's the author of the brilliant bob books coming in to talk about why boys are so lost and how they need role models in society and of course steve denyer popping up at the end for Denya's Delights. Oh, nice, all right. I usually drop that when I'm doing your show. Um, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I love Steve Denya, I'm just saying that to annoy I'll tell you. him. I do actually oh, love him. OK. I think he thinks I don't love him, but I do actually He love told him. me that. Did he? <laughs> no, he didn't. Did he really tell no, me that? Didn't. Oh, I love he Steve Denya. Oh, He's I thought really you dropped nice. him. No, no I, pr I prefer him to you. Uh, thank you, Simon. <laughs> nice to have most you. People. I prefer most people <laughs> yeah. to you, in fairness. I'm back same time, same place, well, that's tomorrow a shame. morning at 5am, <laughs> all here on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Friday nights are changing on Talk TV with not one, but two Mike Grahams. I've got Plank of the Week at 7pm and I've got The World According to Mike Graham at 8pm. That's two Mike Grahams for the price of one. It's not what I was told. You'd be mad to miss it. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious.
Hello, very good morning to you. It's just after 7 o'clock now on Saturday, September the 16th. I'm David Bull. Thank you very much indeed for your company. I hope you're feeling fruity this morning, wherever you are waking up across this great country and indeed around the world. Now, I have some great news for you of monumental significance. Yes, indeed, because today is National Guacamole Day. Oh. oh, yes, indeed. Also, uh, very important news indeed, the Forty Towers weekend kicks off in Dorking. Now, Sybil, that's enough. <laughs> and Mickey Rourke, the star of Nine and a Half Weeks, uh, actually turns 71 today. Hip, hip! <laughs> <laughs> Let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. Today's fascinating facts, right, on this day in 1485, the Yeoman Warders, the bodyguard of the English Crown, better known to you and me as beef eaters, were established by King Henry VII. They actually work full-time at the Tower of London. They're all retired from the armed forces, have at least 22 years of service and must hold the long service and good conduct medal. On this day in 1888, Walter Bentley was actually born. Of course, he is best known for being the British car designer. And on this day in 1968, Britain introduced a two-tier postal system called first and second class. Now, letters and parcels bearing the more expensive first-class stamps would be given priority of delivery. Really? Uh, well, that's the that's the theory anyway. And first class, by the way, is now £1.10, which, in my opinion, is very expensive indeed. And those are today's fascinating facts. <laughs> Talking of very expensive and not worth the money, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Rennie Hunter come and join me this morning. Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. I'm worth every penny. You I'm are worth you know. every penny. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Been it's been a bit of a cold. Oh, yeah. Not, not been to Spain this no. week, no. No. Uh, Didn't need to. Had beautiful sunshine thank in you my for garden. The, yes, and thank you very much for the party Thanks last for weekend. Coming. It was quite fun. Wasn't it, wa it? it was quite fun. Alcohol yes. was imbued. <laughs> Maybe. Yes. <laughs> Let me just tell you, when I got up the next morning at whatever time it was, three o'clock, oh, I didn't feel that clever. That does not surprise <laughs> no, me. No, I really didn't. I really didn't. Anyway, I had to drive, drive home and I was thinking, well, anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you very much. Great party. Um, now, obviously, a lot of politics have been going on in the week. It feels extraordinary. It was only a week ago we did this show because it feels a, an inordinate amount of time. My favourite line from this week is, is Rishi Sunak being called inaction man, which I thought was just priceless and then Penny Morden had the icing on the cake where she actually said Keir Starmer is like a Ken doll because he has no balls. Which Ken doll, Ken doll doesn't have balls does No, he, no. So? And, and, and obviously this is based on the Barbie movie and of course that rather vacuous look that Ken has the whole time. I thought I thought it was pithy, I thought it was very accurate as well. And the question I have this morning really is along those lines, given that Rishi Sunak has been called in Action Man, how would you characterise the leader's of the other parties, and I'm going to ask Renny in a minute. Um, so let me know your thoughts on that. 0344 499 1000, text the word talk in your message to 87222, and tweet us at Talk TV and tweet me at Dr. David Bull. So, how would you characterize? Well, first of all, Keir Starmer, do you think that's fair? I think it's perfect because if you actually <laughs> think about Ken, he looks like Ken, not as handsome, obviously, but a lot like him with that quiffed hair. I'm not quite sure where he is. Not sure where he is, <laughs> being completely overridden by everyone around him. Him. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Fine. Ed Davy. Do you know, I, whenever I think of the Green Party, David, I just no. Think, uh, Lib Dems. He is. Sorry, Lib Dems. <laughs> Lib Dems. I just well, think that, that shows how how important he is to you. <laughs> do you know what? It's because we do, we're just talking about the Greens we were, outside. Yeah. Um, I just said it's just a smiling puppet for nothing. So I'm not who sure would that what. Be? I don't know who it would be. <laughs> I'm not sure what he represents. No. No. I mean, interesting. Let's throw that uh, open to you. Ed Davey, how would you characterise him? Also, the Green Party. Well, I had to actually look up who was the leader of the Green Party. <laughs> well, they party. share it. Of they course share they share it. it. So, who, what's the answer? Well, they're just the misfit group, aren't they? <laughs> it's Carla um, Dent. 
Denyer, according to my writing here, and Adrian Ramsey are the, the co-heads mm. of uh, the Green Party. To me, it's just a collection of misfits. OK. Didn't fit in any that's other That's not really party. a characterisation. I know, but... I'm sure, I'm sure our great viewers and listeners can do better. Let, let me know uh, who uh, the caricatures are of the other parties. It reminds me, actually, of Spitting Image, of course, which would have taken them off beautifully. Ed Davey and, and Keir Starmer and, indeed, Rishi Sunak. But we can't do that now because we've lost that ability <laughs> what, to actually... sense of humour? Yeah, sense of humour. Yeah. I just... I went to the Spitting Image show a few months ago as you know yes and it just wasn't the same because it was very politically motivated whereas spitting image wasn't it was every party it was everyone it. was fame yeah. including the late queen as well absolutely yeah. but in the new spitting image show it was all anti-tory there were there were statements all the time yeah. it was just boring okay uh, let's move on and talk about another really important story actually which is about measles mm. uh, we're seeing more measles cases rising in this country and this headline is unvaccinated children face being forced to self-isolate for 20 21 days because of the rapid rise in measles cases. The modelling shows up to 160. Modeling. Yeah, modelling. 160,000 cases could occur in London <laughs> alone. Now, let's go back a bit. Essentially, you and I know there's low uptake of the, the MMR vaccine. That was partly on the back of that discredited report. Well, by no, it then increased, David. The job was done well and it increased dramatically it and it fell off. In COVID. It did. Let's go back. So Andrew Wakefield, and I remember doing Watchdog Health Check at the time, Andrew Wakefield had uh, produced that discredited report that said it was linked to autism, and then we saw the levels falling off. Then, once all that had died down, as you rightly say, the levels went back up. And then in COVID... Why did the levels drop off again? In because COVID? we destroyed people's trust in medication. That's my honest opinion. Obviously, it was also to do with GP surgeries being shut, not being able exactly. to get face to face. Health visitors were doing things by Zoom. But I actually think when we decided that we would coerce, bully and force people to have the COVID vaccine, People that were awake and thought for themselves sat back and went, hang on a minute, mm. I'm being forced here to put this into my child, because don't forget we bullied children to do it, to put it into myself. I don't think I need it. Why is this happening? So all trust was destroyed. Mm. And we knew, we predicted this at the beginning, David, that childhood vaccine uptakes would fall away, and it has. It has, absolutely. So they bought this on themselves, but now... Weirdly, they've decided that the best way to get the rates up again is to bully and coerce. <laughs> because they haven't learnt, have they? And so what you need to do with parents is to, to make them believe that these are the right things, and they are. And the MMR is a very safe vaccine. That is one thing we do know. It's been tried and tested for a very long period of time. We also need... Do you want to just explain herd immunity? Because we need something like 95% of the population immunised. Well, and we, we, our levels are 75%. 70. And seven, in some places, I think in Haringey, where I work, it's 69. So 67. The world... The world oh. Well, the World Health Organization says that we need levels of 95% to protect everybody because if enough people are vaccinated, the disease itself can't get into enough people to mm. spread because that's how viruses work. But I'm absolutely outraged by this story that we've already destroyed our kids over the last three years. We've bullied and coerced people into medications they didn't want. And now we're going to take away just a bit more of their education and bully them a bit more What's because the that's what then? this is. The answer is to do our jobs properly and convince parents of the value of childhood vaccinations. And, and do you just, for parents who are worried, who maybe have given their child one of the MMR vaccines, but not the second one, for example, do you want to just outline why measles is so important and significant for kids? Well, you know, like all of these, for most kids it isn't. And this is the problem, that for most kids they will get measles and it will pass on by. But for some kids they can actually get complications to do with the brain um, mm. and the rest mm. of their organs there and then. But also there's a later complication that can come in later in life. Mm. And so we're trying to just protect them against that early on. Exactly. And although rare, something like and I remember from my studies years ago, subsclerosing panencephalitis, this terrible damage that you can do to the brain, to the brain would, would be devastating. Oh, I mean, obviously. But then that's the same with anything. You know, whenever you tell someone... We have to remember, David, that all vaccinations, all medications have side effects. So I always say to patients, look, this side effect is really rare. It happens to one in a million mm. people. But if it happens to you... It's 100%. And we must always remember that. That's a good line. So people have to weigh up 
for themselves how they feel about this and how risk sits. I have never, as you know, been one for mandatory vaccinations and I don't think anyone will ever convince me. No, and I'm not in favour. There's still that video doing the rounds where we were discussing the COVID vaccine. And remember, we, that was at the time when all the data was changing. We were also lied to. We were lied to. By the authorities. We were told it stopped transmission. They said it, it stopped, stopped transmission. Infection. And therefore, my li line was there is an argument there for compulsory vaccination, but only predicated on that data. Now, as it transpired, that data was false. Therefore, the argument is no longer there. So people keep saying to me, you want compulsory vaccination. I don't. No. And I mean, look, I, they know my stand on this. I would never, ever support anyone having anything, anything. You know, don't forget that in the GMC standards for doctors, people are allowed to make decisions which are unwise as long as they're competent. Mm. And that is one of the tenets of being a good doctor. Of course it is. You let them. Yeah, I agree. Um, let's also talk about A&E. I mean, it just gets worse and worse. NHS strikes, which we know we're in the middle of. We've got junior doctor strikes taking place on the 20th to the 22nd of September and the 2nd to 5th of October. The senior doctors also walking out 2nd to the 5th of October. This is devastating. It's unbelievably devastating. But as a result of all the strikes we've already seen, we've already seen the busiest summer in A&E on record. And the reason for that is, of course, people can't see a doctor. Well, you know, I mean, they should be able to see a doctor. They of certainly can they see should. a doctor in my practice. But yes, I think A&E has suffered terribly by what we did to our GP practices across COVID. Of course it did. And we are losing GPs. We're not increasing those numbers. So we mustn't forget that. The workforce no. is massive. But having said that, firstly, people use A&E when they shouldn't. And they really do. That is a good point. And, and we need people to actually take some personal responsibility, get to a pharmacist when they need to, get to a GP when they need to, and leave A&E to do what they do. Accidents and emergencies but having said all of that David the juniors and the consultants going on strike on the same day is absolutely disgusting in my view mm. and it shows that they don't care if people die it's politically motivated it totally is politically motivated they're being offered a pay rise which I think is for some of them nine ten percent mm. you know when you've got people like and this came from the independent pay review body it the did. government has said it will honor that and the junior doctors are, are saying vivek uh, ramaswamy uh, uh, vivek uh, trevetti sorry yes. and uh, and rob lawrenson who run the junior doctors committee of course are, are convinced they're going to get 35 percent pay uplift which they're not and then the consultants and it's very difficult to square this when the consultants are compared with most people or, or the vast majority of people in this country are well remunerated oh, very well i mean look you know they're pay rise will be more than some people earn, David, right. if they got the 35%, which they won't. It's political. They know they're not going to get the 35%. Why not actually take what's on the table and make the NHS better? Mm. We all know it's bad. It is. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the head-to-head, -head, actually, because there, there's been a really interesting article written by James DeFano, who's another doctor, about what this does for the reputation of doctors, and I'll talk about that later on uh, this morning. This is a good um, one. Uh, you and I spoke about it in the car this morning. Not that we came in together, and let me just <laughs> add that. Uh, insomnia drug gets the green light from the NHS. The first nightly pill for chronic insomnia has been given the green light for the, from the NHS. This is a medication you take half an hour before bedtime. What is interesting about this particular drug is you go to sleep more quickly and you stay asleep longer and crucially you're not groggy the next day and this will be a massive relief to those people who do suffer and I will stress from chronic insomnia. I know but you know as I always say to my patients who have chronic insomnia firstly sleep is completely psychological and the moment that you become mentally addicted not physically addicted to these tablets so, you'll never sleep but, but, that but there again it is sometimes very difficult to break that psychological uh, totally. cycle. Totally. It's really, really hard. I've been there. I could write the book on sleeping. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, what worries me about this, David, is, is firstly, we're medicating something again that is completely psychological at great profit to the pharma company and great cost to the NHS. And what we don't know is the long term effect on things like dementia. No, and that's most, a good point. But, th but this is short term, they would argue. But no one, t you know, no one wants to take a sleeping tablet short term, David, because the moment they don't take it, they go to bed thinking, I'm not taking a tablet, I'm not going to sleep. And guess what? They're not going to sleep. There is a very good app called sleepio.com, which helps you break that psychological barrier. But you have to be, um, you know, willing to stick to it. And it is a bit brutal. So, so it's it. Well, so you and I have slightly different views on this, as you know. I do take a sleeping tablet, but a, but a mild one, only one night a week, just because when I go oh, upside down, 
fun. So when I start to, from evenings into this show, where, as you know, I get up very early, so I'll use it just then. I then don't use it again. Fine. Because I'm in control. And that's the point in, that you're yeah. making, isn't it? You I need say, to be in control. I would say most patients I see who want sleeping tablets are not in control. I would agree with and that. And what worries me about this is the long-term effects. And most sleeping tablets, taken all of the time, we know, have some sort of effect on dementia and brain conditions that you don't want when you're older. And just in terms of cost, and you're right, I, I, it's £1.42 a day, which is actually quite significant. It's really high, David. Mm, you mm. think how many people across the country have sleeping issues? Yeah, agreed. Uh, let me. <laughs> I just want to talk about um, supermarket checkouts, because yes. I hate them. I hate them. I too. hate them. Un um, what is it? Un unidentified item in bagging area. I mean, I hate these things, and there's a really lovely article written in The Spectator about this, about... Actually, these self-checkouts were brought in to save the supermarkets money, but actually, it takes so long to actually do this yourself as you go through. It goes, an experienced till operator can get through most people's shopping in minutes, and the amateurs like me, it takes far longer. By the end of it, I end up so frustrated. You can't find bananas because it's not actually listed in the banana category. Also, it then talks about loose items yeah. in your bagging area. Where are yeah. these loose items? And I don't really understand it. Also, because the supermarkets have cut out the staff, they're now having to give the security men body cameras yeah. because people are giving up and nicking stuff and walking out with it. And actually, it goes back to something else you and I discussed, which is to have a slow lane for older people who like a chat. I think it's really regressive it's completely impersonal again there's no human interaction we're in, we're in danger of moving towards a world where we never speak to another human being when you're at the checkout you can chat to the woman if they're happy to chat to you or the man who's going yeah. through and doing it and just talk about the day you know the other thing David is if you've got 10 bottles of something you know whatever is water <laughs> and in those self checkouts you've got to put every single one through rather than do one yes. times 10 and put it in your trolley or you have to get a person <laughs> to come and do it they're, they're ridiculous but more importantly I really worry uh, about the jobs we're gonna lose and the human interaction I agree I agree and this is a great line do you think it's justified to put prawns or asparagus in your bag and scan them as potatoes <laughs> Why would you do that? Well, because it's much cheaper. I think I think that the writer of this was so frustrated that they just thought, right, I'm going to scan everything as potatoes. I've never thought of that. You no, see. I I've obviously neither. not got a devious mind. No, obviously I haven't either. And also there are other stores, for example, I've mentioned this before, the Amazon stores, where actually it knows what you've taken. You put it in your bag mm -hmm. and you walk out. It already knows. That, for me, is much cleverer. If you're going to yeah. use technology, do that. By the way, finally, if I may, just talk about Princess Diana's iconic black sheep jumper. Do you remember the one? Of course. Yes, it sold for £1 million at an auction. This is a, a black sheep jumper, uh, which she, she wore. It was a red jumper with white sheep on it, with one black sheep, as far as I remember. I've got the same jumper. Well, get it on eBay now. I don't think it's quite the same. I think it's obscene. So do I. I think it's obscene that we've got people with enough money in the world that they can spend a million quid on an old tatty jumper that someone once wore when there are children mm. starving mm. and children in slavery. I agree. What should they do? Donate that money? Yes. Oh, I agree, I agree. And feel better when they go to sleep at night? Which you would. Well, Which you would. you'd like to think you so. You wouldn't feel better if you just got a red, a ju red jumper, would you? Well, these people obviously do, otherwise they wouldn't be spending oh, that I kind agree, of money I on agree. it. Well, we'll never know what it's like to have a million pounds to spend on a jumper, no. will we? So, but uh, we could start knitting them and selling them for a hundred. <laughs> Good plan. Let's do that this evening. Um, <laughs> right, um, so this morning I'm asking you, given that Rishi Sunak has been called inaction man, Keir Starmer is a Ken doll because he has no balls, according to Penny Morden. How would you characterise the other political leaders? I want to hear the way that you characterise Richard Tice. That will be very interesting. I just thought that maybe um, one of them's Homer Simpson. <laughs> Who? Which one? Mm. Maybe a David. <laughs> I think just, Eddie, you know, just going around. <laughs> just going, oh, not, oh. not really knowing what's going no, on. Oh. Uh, give us a oh. ring, 03, that's it. Oh. Uh, 03, double four, four nine nine one thousand. Text the word, talking your message to 8722. And tweet us at Talk TV. Uh, this is Talk TV. Oh. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Not working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah.
Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability, we need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Yes, Labour absolutely. 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the no, polls. No, 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 did he say, yes, I have taken drugs and they bent the rules or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unravelled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! Yeah. Yeah. If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off short in this <laughs> oh, Get her out. Mark, Get her out. Mark. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drug. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? <laughs> <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast with me, David Bull. The time, 7.25 now on Saturday, September the 16th. You're on fire this morning because I've been asking about Rishi Sunak. Uh, he's in Action Man. Uh, and, of course, uh, Keir Starmer was, was Ken because he had no balls, according to Penny Morton. Uh, good morning, David and Rennie. It's Craig in Durham. Fantastic to see you and your fantastic show. Good morning, Doctors. Starmer is mould man, says John in Lincolnshire. Good morning, Doctors. You can sum up uh, Keir, Keir Starmer in a movie title, Two Face. Emily Thornbury is Fagash Lil, according to, according to Mick, which I think rather good. Uh, some of you uh, take a rather stronger view. Good morning, David and Rennie. How would you characterise the leader of this country? They're useless, useless parasites, as are all politicians. That's a bit rough. Steve Ronson in Cambridge. What are you grinning at? What did you get? Um, I got that Ed Davey is a weeble. He wobbles, but he won't fall down. <laughs> I think these are rather good. Uh, Dr David is on talk. TV with his sidekick, Dr. Rene. They light up our day when our mood is so great. I'm sure they're both worth their fee. Oh, thank you. Very nice. Thank <laughs> what you. fee? Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Simon in Hull. Keep all of those is going. Anna said, Ed Davey is Mr. Magoo. Oh, do you remember yes. Mr. Magoo? You're too young. R Richard Tyson, Shaggy from Scooby Doo. <laughs> and um, when he. <laughs> <laughs> when he becomes an accountant. Oh, brilliant. Keep all of these coming in. Uh, I've got Richard Dice on st speed dial. I'll, Do you uh, remember Shaggy with his shirt right? and, and tie on when yeah. he became an accountant? Right. <laughs> yeah, so I love Scooby-Doo, actually. And Scrappy-Doo. Uh, anyway, well, that shows my age. Uh, right, let's move on. It's time for the paper review. Joining us this morning, Julian Drucker, Five News correspondent. Good morning. Good morning, both... Good morning. You, doctors, good to see you. Very nice to see you, too. Good. It's been a long time. It has. Yes. <laughs> Um, do you know what? It's what? September the 16th. I'm going to make a prediction. This time next year, we'll be in an election campaign. <sighs> brave. Ooh, that is well, brave. Well, people think it will be October for the polling. Some people so think we'll be, May, though. I think yeah. it might be earlier. Well, 
I mean, it may not make any difference, but... Um... <laughs> there again, obviously, Rishi Sunak has five pledges written behind him at yes, all times, of yes. which he can meet almost none of them. Um, so we shall see, shall yes. we? He might just need a bit longer. <laughs> well, but he can't. He has to do the election by October or thereabouts. It could be. Um, I mean, on the front of the mail, let's, um, on the front pages today, um, Labour's 20 miles per hour speed limit is beyond insane. So this is tying in with this thought that, you know, an election is obviously on the way, but just, you know, Labour's blueprint for the country. So this comes in tomorrow, doesn't it, in Wales, this uh, making loads of 30 miles per hour roads, 20 miles per hour, and the Tories are saying, you know, this is what's going to happen basically across the whole UK if, if Labour get in, possibly this time next year. So, so in my neck of the woods in East London, they've done this as well. It is deeply frustrating. They say this reduces child deaths on the road significantly, and I was looking at the stopping distances, which I think aren't actually that accurate no. based on new vehicles, which can stop much faster. Than well, these were done yeah. almost a hundred years ago yeah. in some cases. Yeah. So, and so, the, so the RAC say that it doesn't reduce deaths so much, and it doesn't change emissions so much. That it is just an, an attack on cars. And I, I know the RAC would probably be expected to say that, but I agree. It just it just seems extraordinary to me. It's yet more authoritarianism, isn't it? That says you can't do this. You've got to do this. You've got to drive at twenty miles an hour. I was listening to a builder last night uh, being interviewed, and he was saying that it will add so much time to his his day and mm. there'll be a, such a cost implication to yeah. his business as well and yet again it, it's working people hit time and time again by these numpties in government who think they know best yeah and i think you also have to think that when we keep cars idling in london doing 20 miles an hour there's many more emissions than they are when they're driving oh, yeah, at like 30. Speed i drove this week on park lane in the day which weirdly on the side that isn't one lane now the side that still has three weirdly was flowing what? quite one's well got one, one side has got three yeah one side's uh, yeah, got one yes, lane yeah. What? One when, side when now is a happen? bus lane cycle and then one lane of cars. I think it was in lock. COVID, wasn't it? Yeah. As in, you know, oh, lots of these that. cycle lanes came in almost mm. literally overnight, didn't they? But it's like. 20 miles an hour, even when it's absolutely free on the other side. And it's almost impossible. So what happens is at 20 miles an hour, you have to qu keep looking at uh, your dashboard. So you're not actually looking at, at the, the car. Road. Mm. So how is this playing out? What, what does the article say in terms of the political backlash? Well, Greg Hands, Tory party chairman, saying uh, Mark Drakeford is bringing Wales to a standstill. It's merely a test case of Sakir's own blueprint for government. We're going to get lots of this, aren't we, now yeah. in, the, in yeah. the coming months? Things they're doing in other parts, obviously it's a devolved issue, but things that are happening in, in other parts of the country, you know, they're suggesting will be brought in if Labour get to power. It just seems to me it's more revenue raising, isn't of course, it? That's exactly it's what cameras, it is. it's like, let's track everything you do. You go 20. So I think you have a 10% margin of error on those cameras. So yes. anything yeah, over yeah. 22, you are then fine. So 23, you'll be fine. So Matt's cartoon today is brilliant. I sent it to you in the car you this did. morning. There's a couple in a car saying, oh my goodness, we're going to be late. And the husband says, don't worry, I'll jump out and run ahead to let them know. <laughs> but it's true. Um, it, I, I, it will be very interesting. I think you're going to start seeing polarity between yeah. those more draconian authoritarian sides and those who are more libertarian in these, saying you make your own decisions. Yes. And the thinking is as well that people will get out of their cars if the traffic is so slow at 20. So it's a way of getting people to use public transport. To simply walk, it will be quicker to walk in many places if everyone's going at 20. But, but that's fine. And I'm all in favour of pedestrianisation of certain roads. Mm. Uh, um, I think Oxford Street, for example, in London would be a very good one to pedestrianise. There are many around the country and some of the zones have done very well. But equally, shouldn't it be about choice? Mm. Well, and also, and it should consider everybody in society who needs to use a car. You know, do we want our nurses and carers walking from patient to patient in the middle of the night? Do we really? Well, no. You know, what we should have is around schools. Like in America, you have um, these zones around schools where you can't drive above a certain level. And they are, they are, they are absolutely adhered to because people know that that's the rule and mm. that's what we must do here. But not everywhere. It's ridiculous. Of course it is. There's a lovely insert. Did you see that on page six? Oh, yes, yeah. Tell, it, tell us about that. Sadiq Khan, because you, Les, as we yes. know, has gone down very badly and people are still vandalising the cameras. And as we saw... One every eight seconds. <laughs> one every eight seconds. Simon Forthrop was on earlier, uh, who is a councillor in one of those outer boroughs. Uh, and, and again, you know, they've now issued parking fines to the mobile camera vans yes. to say, stop parking on our verge. <laughs> Um, yes, Sadiq Khan, like that. Sadiq Khan thought he yeah. said he was addressing the UN General Assembly tomorrow. He's, he's attending, which is obviously not the same thing. To which uh, he has flown. Yes, to which, to which he's, he's flown. flown. And that is the hypocrisy of this. Yes, uh, he's taking part in the Bodies uh, Climate Ambition Summit. 
Uh, but yeah, he's been condemned for going there at all. But he's going to talk about the ULAs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and talk about uh, how successful it's been in his words. Well, it hasn't. Uh, well, seven thousand miles. How, he's how, going. How, how has it been successful? I don't know how he's going <laughs> to. It's, spin, Sadiq's it's world. still too early to suggest, isn't it? Even on a, you know, yeah. if he's trying to spin it. Oh, Sadiq Khan. What caricature is he? That's another mm, good one. It is. It's usually yeah. about his height, isn't it? But obviously, Rishi is quite small as well. So. <laughs> yeah. um, no comment. Talking of Rishi, I mean, yes. this horrendous story about the XL bully dogs. You'll have seen that video Rishi Sunak did yesterday saying uh, he's going to outlaw these dogs. It comes after this uh, poor guy in Staffordshire. Uh, I think it was Thursday, wasn't it? But his, his death was announced yesterday, possibly linked to these XL bullies. Mm. But it's not clear. Ian if Ian Price, that was 52. The, brand, yeah. 52. the sixth um, person to die in a dog attack in England this year. What a horrific way to mm. die as well. I mean, but he was protecting his mother, wasn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the dogs were going near his uh, mother's house, weren't they? Uh, it's not clear with this legislation how it will be brought in. Uh, there was a caller yesterday on Talk TV to Vanessa just saying, you know, he's had one of these dogs for a couple of years. Is he going to have to get rid of it? He was in tears. So, as with lots of you know, legislation, it really isn't clear what it means if you've got one of these dogs at the moment. And lots of owners of them say, you know, they're just puppies or they're, you know, they're usually calm. There'll be lots of people saying... Until they you know, rip your arm off. Well, this is so it. The, um, the problem is, you have an animal, however calm it is and nice, that has the potential to kill someone, whether it's an XL bully or an Alsatian or a Doberman. And you never know, they're pack animals, when and something's going to go wrong. I saw my neighbour attacked by his two Alsatians that he'd had for 10 years. He was an army dog handler. He had to be rescued out of his house before the dogs were destroyed. The problem we have here is that people are very emotive about their animals, and I understand that, but they're saying, oh, it's not the dogs, it's the owners. Well, in the States, they say it's not the gun, it's the people, mm. but still thousands of people die. And I'm afraid you, it's actually easier to legislate for dogs than it is for guns. Interesting with these dogs, the XL bullies, are believed to be responsible for 70% of dog-related deaths in Britain. It also found that half of all American XL bully dogs are descendants of one killer inbred dog called Kimbo, producing dozens of unstable and violent animals. These have been bred for their fighting characteristics, haven't they? They mm. have, David, but if from your very stat, that means that 30% of deaths are not an XL bully. They're a mm. dog, another dog. We need something to control dogs. Maybe there are, we license the owners and there are draconian fines. If you know they're not doing Actually, the things, why that they don't need to we do. license? Should we license dog? Well, there owners? used to be dog licenses. Mm -hmm. didn't they? I think they still do it in Northern Ireland. Um, I don't why know why don't we? Well, exactly. Uh, but it, people, politics students will always talk about the Dangerous Dogs Act in the early nineties, yes, wasn't it, it John didn't Major? Work. It's always yeah, it was brought in really quickly. It was a bad piece of legislation. Yeah, it's always held well. up as some of the worst legislation. It was done, you know, because of the headlines. A bit like this is some people will say. Um, it's, you know, the nuts and bolts of it are really, really complicated. What do you do if you've got one of these dogs at the moment? Well, also. How do you classify some of these dogs? Because exactly, that's yes, another yeah. issue. Yeah. And also, if you outlaw this one, what about one that's almost well, like it, well, but not quite like exactly. it? Exactly. Mm. So this is why we need something else. And I know that I caused a lot of upset this week by suggesting that dogs get muzzled or are always Do you want to just leash? explain your policy, just to see so what I, the reaction is? I put out in the week that all dogs should be muzzled outside, and that went down like, I can't tell you. So if, some, if a dog is outside being walked by their owner, you want them muzzled. Well, that's what I suggested. Or even like a Labradoodle in a handbag but or something. Labradoodles can kill well, you. Yeah. Labradoodles can be quite big, actually. What, by licking you to death? Well, a Labradoodle. <laughs> well, it's a big dog. <laughs> All right. It's a gumball. No, I'm listening, I'm yeah. listening. Um, so then I said, OK, I'm listening to you. I've upset mm. you. What if we have this? That dogs are on a leash all of the time and then if they're off they're muzzled oh my god i mean the, the reaction i found really really interesting i'm a pet lover i have pets but i wish people would get as exercised about the 1.5 million children in slavery as we sit here in this studio and speak because i care more about them mm. than i do our pets i'm afraid i care more about humans than i do about pets and i love pets and i wish that we would actually get so exercised about these kind of things Inter interesting so many messages coming in already i'm so sick says zoe in cheltenham of the animal behaviorist they don't care about people they only care about making money from bad dogs and defending them so that's very much on, on point but politically this would be a very difficult thing to pull off wouldn't it if yeah. you said all dogs have to be muzzled at all times i mean maybe maybe a licensing thing is a better way where everyone is chipped you know exactly whose dog is what and mm. so on and also but the courts would have to get involved with this in terms of as you say exactly what breed are they it would be really really it complicated would. i'm also quite upset that rishi can 
can bring a bit of legislation like this as quickly as he can, but he can't publish the sex education guide for <laughs> children after 18 months. No, I know, because there's a, a lot of controversy still about that. And well, there's a lot of controversy well, and, and, about this. Well, indeed, no, I meant so head teachers saying, help, we need some yeah. help, we need some guidance on this trans stuff, which you promised us and you still haven't delivered. Uh, no, I agree. Let's move on to the Times now, shall we? Yes. This is page 18. Goodness, yeah. I, 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 I suppose we expected this. Uh, tell us the story. Yes, this came through sort of yesterday afternoon, didn't it? Lucy Letby obviously was convicted around about a month ago. Uh, she's going to challenge her convictions for murdering uh, seven babies and attempted to kill another, si uh, another six. Um, yeah, we expected this. She has lodged... Um, this permission to appeal. We don't know whether she'll be given that permission. Also, the decision's going to be made in a couple of weeks' time about whether they'll retrial on some of these counts that the jury couldn't decide on the attempted murders. Obviously, you know... I mean, she will get permission to appeal, won't well, she? Well, presumably, but it's, well, you know... She? Well, I think she has to have the right to appeal. I really do. And then and then the process from there, what happens next? Well, it would just go to the High Court. I mean... This, this is what gets prisoners through And do people have to give prison. evidence all over again? No, no, I mean, it would just be a decision made by the sort of oh, okay. High Court judges. But so it's I mean, not it's... another ten months no, of the no, same no, thing? No, 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 I mean, this is how prisoners get through life in prison, by thinking, oh, I'm going to appeal. Um, but, yeah, it's, but... Just, it's just another difficult day for those families. Obviously, they didn't mm -hmm. get to see her during the sentencing process. And, you know, she's sitting there in her cell... Um, I mean, I saw her give evidence um, when she was up in court in Manchester. I mean, just sort of swaggering, really. You don't really get that from the mugshot you see of her. No, she was just don't. sort of so kind of haughty. But she wasn't there at the uh, the sentencing no, either. No. I think that is appalling, and I think yes, she should yeah. have been there. She should have been made to be there. Mm, yes, you, you yeah. don't get any argument from me. But I think it was... I mean, you saw some of that case. Mm. I think it was the prosecution who said to her, the only time you've cried in this trial is when it's been about you. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and those friends who we've seen on the TV, I um, wonder what they're thinking now. Lots of their interviews were done before the verdict. Mm. I wonder if they're still sort of standing by at the moment. Mm. And also for the families, here mm. we go. They they thought they had some sense of closure, and now, of course, it's all reopened again, and it must mm. be horrendous. Although I did hear a parent on a different case in the week say that you... He said it to you, actually, David. You never get closure when it's an avoidable death. No, I'm sure... Wait, no, you never get closure. You learn to live with it, yeah. don't you? I think, and they are slightly different. Interestingly, uh, hi, David and Rene. Great show. However, regarding dogs always wearing muzzles, humans can also kill you. Should everyone be handcuffed outside? But you see, these arguments are ridiculous, aren't they? Because we don't keep humans as pets number one we don't see humans running rampage down the high street and biting people you know this argument doesn't stack up it's mm. a silly argument we are humans it's our world dogs we're bringing into it as pets Ooh, it's our some world. humans wear muzzles as well if you go around sort of Vauxhall on a saturday <laughs> night <laughs> okay i think we'll <laughs> swiftly move on uh Gillian, i don't know where you were last night but there we are uh, the daily mirror uh, page two this this is a a, a really interesting story 500 million pounds spent yes. by the government Tell us this story. This is the Tartar uh, steel story. So up to 3,000 steel workers, this is in Port Talbot in South Wales. So they're going to switch from traditional old-fashioned coal-fired coal blast furnaces. They're going to switch to less polluting electric arc production, as it's known. So that will future-proof this plant. However, in the process, uh, 3,000 jobs are going to be lost. And we're, we're shoving in 500 million quid of exactly. our money to make sure this happens. I mean, yeah. I'm, I think it's really interesting that this has not hit every front page today, no. because this is the true cost of net zero. We have 3,000 people who work in industries around this country where their whole town and village will be employed by that plant. Suddenly, mm. 3,000 of them don't have a job anymore because we're going to have a cleaner and environment. And that's not 3,000 people, that's 3,000 families. Three and the families. income yeah. and then the decimation to the local economy, to the shops, 100%. to the to everything. One hundred percent. And we're spending five hundred million pounds to do it. The cost of net zero is unacceptable to everyday. But families. this is why I keep saying we need a referendum on net zero because I didn't vote for it, you didn't vote for it, and I bet those three thousand workers didn't vote for it either. No, of course they didn't. But the counter argument is it keeps it going for 
longer you know places like middlesbrough where they've lost plants you know and it's mm. all the other jobs around there the cafes well, if we want to stop using fossil fuels mm. there's plenty of fossil fuels around the world mm, and, and again i was listening to one of the the workers who was a coke stoker and he was saying that actually in terms there's at least 10 15 years worth of uh, viable coal there at least so they could uh, carry on and there's plenty around the world of course there is so so but again politically is this I just don't know what they believe anymore. Do the politicians seriously believe what they're saying? Or is this just a nod to um, the, the climate change debate? Well, alongside this, we've seen BMW get, I think, about 500 million yes. to yeah. um, carry on their plant making batteries now for minis. And they apparently put pressure on Sunak to not extend the 2030 of course ban they do. on diesel cars. But then equally, yeah. then the EU is kicking off, saying, well, actually, you can't import batteries that uh, you're bringing across from the EU because some of the parts come from China. So th th there's not a joined up argument mm. here. The 2030, I've read elsewhere today, you know, Rishi is not going to waver on that. He's yeah. King with the 2030. What, and we'll all just freeze? Because well, because BMW exactly, made it yes, part yeah. of the deal. They made him give him... So our policy is now being run by one businesses. of our corporations, businesses. Yeah. Well, that's always been the way, hasn't mm. it? I mean, also, it goes back to... And I keep saying all of these homes around the country that there is no way you can heat an old drafty uh, mm. property in the country where you rely on oil with a, a heat pump. And they're no good in the cold, that people are now saying. <laughs> they're, not, they're no good I mean, in the I've cold. I've never used one, but it's... Well, don't. Well, because they're rubbish. Well, they're, that's what people say, but particularly in the cold, people are going to be shivering <laughs> They work well in countries where the temperature doesn't drop. That's yes. right. Below yeah. about seven degrees. Yeah, so that is not this country. No. So, therefore, they're rubbish in this country. And, and again, don't the politicians... I mean, this is the interesting thing for These me. are air source heat pumps, by the way. Yes. Ground source is a different argument, but... But you have to dig up a lot of land do. to do that. Which and you can't do in a terrorist house. No, really. no. Or no. Flat, or no. And that, that goes back to another issue, which is about charging electric cars if you live in a terraced house. Mm. How do you do that? Mm. Well, we've got about six years to find out, seven <laughs> years, haven't we? Yes, and, that, and, 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 and we're literally walking towards a cliff and no one knows how to do it because the technology isn't there. Well, don't worry, yeah. Rishi will have a charger. <laughs> and yes, how does he heat his swimming pool? Yes. Exactly. Mm, that's a good point, isn't I it? Wonder. Uh, let's uh, move on, Matt Hancock. There's someone who would shiver yeah. um, whatever oh. the temperature is. I'm Matt shivering Hancock. looking at that. So he's shirtless in the Daily Mirror on page 7, that if you want to avoid look. that. Uh, this is a TikTok video with the people. He's on another reality show. This is the SAS Who Dares Wins show on Channel 4. Uh, he's doing a dance with various celebrities like Gareth Gates, if you can remember him. Um, this was filmed, <laughs> actually... I'd rather look at Gareth Gates and Matt Hancock, well, I can tell you. This is, this is the MP for West Suffolk, of course. This was actually filmed before he did I'm a Celebrity last year. He'd already done this programme. It's not airing until the end of this month. Um, but uh, I think £45,000 he was paid to appear on this. Yes. This was declared and everything. But um, I don't know why he didn't stand down as an MP at the height of his quote-unquote fame he, last because, year. Because he had no insight into what he was doing. Well, I, think. The, I think Hancock is probably your textbook definition of a true narcissist, isn't he? Mm. He really is. I would agree. And I don't think he's very bright, so I think it, that actually just enables it. I'm sorry, I'm going to say that, I really don't. Yeah. He, he was clearly popular with the public in I'm a Celebrity. I just don't understand why he didn't... Well, we can see the quick. dancing now, I see. Right, yeah. yes, yes, so this is a TikTok video. This man has children that have to go <laughs> to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People <laughs> clearly like him, though. I mean, he, he came third in, I, in the but jungle. Why? But isn't it because they wanted to keep uh, him yeah, in? Yeah, I think to, they for wanted the humiliation. to keep him in. I mean... Look at him, look at his face, look. He can't dance. I mean... He makes me feel sick. <laughs> Imagine you're a constituent writing to him about your blog. Well, of course, I mean, he's an independent, isn't he? And he is standing yes, down. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's another one leaving uh, being an MP. But you're right. Imagine if you've got really important constituency issues and you see him doing whatever he's doing. It's mesmerising, isn't it? I can't take my eyes off it. <laughs> no, it, 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 it is indeed. He'll be in Strictly next, won't he? We could be, that's this evening, isn't it? He's uh, oh. not on there, but... <laughs> Maybe Liz Truss in the jungle. People are still saying this could happen. Oh, now that would be good. Or Dominic Raab in the jungle as in well. The jungle, yes, yeah. Apparently, he's <laughs> given his TV out to various sort of companies at the moment. Dominic Raab. So this is there's going to be lots of this uh, as people stand <laughs> so down. So Christo wants to be in, in Strictly. Would you do the jungle? 
Uh, yeah, potentially. I yeah. want to yeah. be in Strictly. Forget Christo. I want to be in Strictly. <laughs> I don't think I'd be. There'd have to be an Ebola strike where all of <laughs> celebrities and showbiz would have to be wiped out for them to then. <laughs> well, come and not speak true. To not true. You're very much A-list, Julian. Thank you. Thank yes. You. Uh, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Uh, that's Julian Drew for their Five News correspondent. Right. Time for a break. After the break, we'll have all the sporting uh, headlines with Tom Clayton. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. The time 7.50 now on Saturday, September the 16th. Already, golly. Uh, it was really dark, actually, when I got to work as I well. Know. It's really depressing, it's really actually. Really depressing. <laughs> really depressing. Jeans and jumpers will be coming out soon. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. It's the last of the floral shirts, I think. Uh, David, uh, that video of Matt Hancock has really ruined my Saturday, <laughs> says Robin. Thank you very much, Robin in West Sussex there. Good morning, Fab Show. Thank you very much indeed. It's Matt Hancock recreating those TikTok videos the nurses made when... Uh, he shut the hospitals during COVID. That's Annie. Thank you for that. I think advertising Matt Hancock on I'm a Celebrity is an insult to people who had to watch their loved ones die alone during COVID. Some uh, of what they uh, they some of uh, they have called us conspiracy theorists, and we told you so, Robin. Thank you. Um, good morning, doctors. I'm asking about how you would actually characterise the political leaders. This is Rishi Sunak being in action man. Penny Morden calling Keir Starmer uh, Ken uh, because he has no balls. And Cliff in Berkshire says, Keir Starmer is Vic's vapour rub. He gets right up your nose and he stays there for up to eight hours. Keep all of those coming in, please. But right now, it's time for Tom Clayton's Sporting Weekend. Tom Clayton's Sporting Weekend.
That was close, wasn't it? I mean, close enough, yeah. Um, can I say, <laughs> by the way, I am thrilled that autumn is coming around. I don't have to dress brightly anymore. You're not a summer man. I'm not at all. It's too hot. Too oh. hot. Absolutely. Even now, it's too hot. <laughs> so you've gone into mid-winter clothing, Absolutely. I see. I mean, I have two extremes. I have bright summer and beach, or I have mid-winter. You There's didn't really have winter. bright summer. Th that's bright summer for me. It was vague summer. Now, yeah. boys, I'm oh, sorry. Anyway, stop arguing yeah. about um, Should we talk about some sport? <laughs> yes. Um, should we start with Luis uh, Rubiales? Yes, and we found out yesterday he was in court, and he's been handed a 200 metres restraining order over Jenny Hermoso, the player that he kissed off the back of the mm. World Cup final. Um, now, that had, some very basic maths has told me that that means, essentially, if Jenny Hermoso is playing a game of football in a stadium, he won't be able to be in said stadium. So that's part of it. He's also denied any wrongdoing. How long did it take you to work that out? Because um, I was thinking that is quite a clever piece of maths. Well, it only took me a couple of minutes because yeah, I, I, I kind of thought, okay. well, it's a 200 metres thing, the pitch is 100 metres. Yeah. I hadn't and then, even thought of it like that. You know, the, the size of a stadium isn't... You it's know, a deliberate thing. It's designed yeah. to stop him being involved in mm -hmm. the game. Mm -hmm. The prosecutors originally wanted 500 metres, um, which would have been quite substantial. Mm. You know, that's not just within a stadium, that's a, a significant area. Right. Um, but no, so 200 metres is the is is the requirement now he must stay outside right. of 200 metres. I think it's important to know about this, and I'm sure you'll mm. have some views on this, Tom, that whilst this is a one event, that I, I've seen some commentators saying that we're blowing this out of proportion. There has been a problem in Spain and in yeah. Spanish sport for many years. Absolutely. There have been many women, sportswomen, trying to speak up and never being allowed. We've just seen three Real Madrid stars accused of having sex with an underage girl. Mm. There is a big problem in Spain, and Luis Rubiales was the last straw that broke that donkey's back. And then adding the fact that Mason Greenwood, the English footballer who had his charges dropped of, of, a, of a similar nature, he's been admitted to uh, go and play football in Spain oh, as well. He could make he could make his uh, debut for Hetafe today, which I think and, is really and, interesting. And uh, if that is the case, why do we think there is a problem in Spain? Um, I don't know. It's a very good question, and I think you have to look into the culture of Spain. Whether you know, are they behind us in terms of in terms of equal rights? Are they different in their attitude? I think it's a I really interesting question. I think they are in question. many ways about mm. many things. You've mm. got to remember, of course, it was a dictatorship well, I, under Franco. It's been a very patriarchal society. Yeah. Well, it I, is, isn't it? I, I I used to live with a Spanish guy. I lived with him for about two and a half years, and we were completely night and day in a lot of our views. Not necessarily political or anything like that, but just in how we did things. You know, everything down to when they eat in different times of the day. He found it bizarre that I used to eat my dinner at half six, seven Oh, they eat at half ten. He eats at half ten. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is a but, shock. But, but that's also to do with the climate. And this, this came to a head about four years ago when there was a very high-profile court case against about six men who were filmed having yeah. sex with a young girl who was unconscious. Um, oh. And the, the judges found in the favour of the men, they said she gave consent. Yeah. She was unconscious. So this came to a head and there were lots of protests on the streets. So it's been bubbling and bubbling. Yeah. Yeah. Women have not had the status that they need yeah. in Spain. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on. Yes, let's move on. Uh, we will talk about the Singapore Grand Prix. Uh, not because of what's happening on track, because, <laughs> although we're not going to get what we expect this weekend because apparently Red Bull are terrible which is fantastic news. Right. Um, so Ferrari might actually win a race this year. So, so just explain for people who don't know why we're people looking at Rene. Uh, people who don't know why we're looking at Rene, and that is purely because Rene's son, Callum, mm -hmm works for Red Bull as one of the mechanics in the pit team. Who and, I met uh, at the weekend. Mm. He's very tall. I, I like tall men, I have always said this to you. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. He's so not like you. No, but I mean, he is really. Oh, he's really argumentative, so that's a bit like you. Yeah. Uh, he's very opinionated. Very much like you, yeah. <laughs> very, very much like But he's you. very left wing. But he's very left wing. So um, it covers the spread quite nicely. Anyway, the reason mm. why we're bringing up this Singapore Grand Prix is because during the first two practice sessions, something that goes unnoticed every year, and this year has kind of been hyped up a lot, the track has been invaded by a group of lizards. I saw these pictures. These are, big monitor, these are big monitor lizards which can grow up to three metres in length. Whoa. And they, you know, because they're used to just kind of roaming around. It's in Singapore, a tropical climate. Yeah, of course. Um, so they're getting onto the I track. I wouldn't roam across just, the track if I were you. <laughs> well, no, this is, this is the thing. You know, so a lot of drivers are saying, you know, Godzilla's on the track and things like that. Because obviously they're in Asia as well, so playing up to that but i just i just find it fantastic didn't they have to did they have to swerve or they so basically they put I mean, out you see lizards you're they like... put out they put out a yellow flag so the car slowed down and drove around them of course they'd you know be, they're not going to if they hit one of those they'll damage their car well, oh, they, yeah, they'll, the car, they'll wreck they? the car yeah, yeah. 
Um, they'll do a lot of damage to the lizard as well because they they're going 200 miles an hour. But um, yeah, I just find it absolutely fascinating <laughs> that this is happening. I it's love it. lizards. Yeah, yeah. I'd like one of those. I think they're very sweet actually, and they yeah. just wander around. <laughs> yeah. um, right, and what's next? Uh, we'll wrestle through the last two. Um, so Premier League's back after the international break. Jurgen Klopp's been complaining, shock horror, um, because the Liverpool manager says that TNT Sports, formerly BT Sports, yes, you see, I, I, that had summer. passed me by. I didn't know that um, had happened. So TNT Sport have selected them for the Saturday lunchtime kickoff, and Jurgen Klopp's complaining that that's happened more to Liverpool than any other club um, in the last few years. Is that a bad slot? Right. So, so it is, I'd... because it means the players get less right, rest. Right, so I didn't that. understand that the broadcaster dictates when they play. Yeah, that's correct. So there's a set group. I had set no idea. Of, there's a set number of broadcast slots, and, be, uh, well, TNT Sports, as it is now, own the 12.30 Saturday lunchtime kickoff slot. Mm. So I they choose see. every week, but they've chosen Liverpool 12 times in the last Why? few because years. Why? Because they like to watch them? Yeah. It's because it's viewing. Figures. Well, they get good viewing figures. They they bring people in, and also I think people can't really complain. They're a victim of their own success. Yeah. I also I also kind of think they like the uh, the hate they get from Jurgen Klopp. It gets them a bit of publicity. There you go. Um, but yeah, and then I uh, just wanted to have a word on Andy Murray as well. He won in yeah. his uh, he won in the Davis Cup yesterday, um, but very sadly had to miss his grandmother's funeral to be there, mm. and was very emotional in his post match interview. Uh, did very well. It was a three hour three hour match to put Britain two 0 up in the Davis Cup tie but yeah it, it, very difficult for him and I can't imagine in any circumstance having to miss a person no, I'm not sure how I feel about that job. actually yeah mm. I mean I you know I've sadly been to a few funerals yeah. in my lifetime already and you know work has never come ahead of me no, no, no. so I can't imagine being in that position no. No, very sad indeed. Uh, Tom, sad. thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. That was Tom Clayton's Sporting Weekend. Tom Clayton's Sporting Weekend. Uh, lots of messages coming in, as you would expect. Uh, Robert Taylor in Nottingham. Uh, hi, David and Renee. I would call Keir Starmer Chameleon Man. That's mm, quite interesting, that's quite actually. Good, actually. I really don't ever know. He, he does, does tend to, to flip-flop around. Uh, and Richard Tice is too nice. He's like a Ken doll. We need an action man. Give me a call, Richard. I will happily be your special advisor. I'll do the job for free. I'm losing the will to live with politics. That's Anna in Surrey. Right, uh, Anna, I'll pass that on for you. Uh, lots of other messages coming in as well about uh, all of those. So I've been asking this morning, if uh, Rishi Sunak is an action man, Keir Starmer is, is Ken, because he has no balls, according from uh, from uh, uh, Penny Morden, uh, then uh, how would you characterise all the rest of them? Dan in Kent says it's a bit harsh. Sunak does look like Roland Rat. Sorry to you, <laughs> Roland. He actually does. <laughs> he does a little. <laughs> I have to, it was a bit, bit harsh, though. Uh, Sadiq Khan, uh, he's one I wanted to know about. Sadiq Khan uh, would be Rat Man, according to this one. Mm. I think you can do better than that. I think so too. Uh, keep all of those coming in, please. Also, after the break, and it is time for a break uh, just shortly. After the break, we're going to be talking about the migration crisis. Of course, this is one of the biggest political issues. Rishi Sunak has said he will sort out the migration crisis. Keir Starmer now says he has a plan. And the plan is being called delusional by the EU themselves. We'll be talking about that after this break. This is Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious. Good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Stop working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability. We need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30pm. 
the Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Yes. Labour are 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the no, polls. No, no, can we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs and they bent the rules or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this now. Get her out! Mark, get about get out. Mark. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? By this <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. Just when I was getting used to my show, What Just Happened, being on Talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, What Just Happened. I am furious. Hello, very good morning to you. It's just after 8 o'clock now on Saturday, September the 16th. I'm David Bull. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your company. I hope you're fine and fruity this morning. Uh, I have great news, though. Uh, news of monumental significance to this great nation, and that is it's National Guacamole Day. Ooh. <laughs> uh, the Forty Towers weekend kicks off today in Dorking. Now, Sybil, that's enough. <laughs> Sybil, that's enough. Mickey Rourke, star of Nine and a Half Weeks. Uh, actually turns 71 today. Hip, hip! <laughs> Let's start today's show, shall we? Today's fascinating facts. Some corkers for you this morning. Uh, today's fascinating facts. On this day in 1485, the Yeoman Warders, the bodyguard of the English Crown, better known to you and me as Beef Eaters, were established by King Henry VII. They actually work full-time at the Tower of London. They are all retired members of the armed forces. They all have at least 22 years of service, and they must also hold the Long Service and Good Conduct Medal. On this day in 1888, a chap called Walter Bentley was born. Of course, he was the British car designer. And on this day in 1968, Britain introduced a two-tier postal system, first and second class. Now, the idea at that time was letters and parcels bearing the more expensive first-class stamps would be given priority of delivery. Hmm, I, I think that's meant to still stand. And first class is now £1.10, which is very expensive. One more for you. Uh, in 2021... Sir Clive Sinclair died. Now, Sir Clive Sinclair is a big figure in my growing up, actually, because I was amazed that he was a fantastic British inventor, came up with things like uh, the ZX Spectrum, the ZX81, which I had. A, it's a computer, by the way. It didn't do very much, but it was a computer. Uh, he had kick calculators as well, and his best invention ever was the Sinclair C5. The car. The car. <laughs> if you're old enough to remember... Well, it was a sort of car. It was more like a sort of mobile coffin, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it was a battery car. It was a battery car. Bat battery coffin holder or whatever. Uh, and those are today's fascinating facts. So many messages uh, coming can I, can in. Can I give you a fascinating fact? Oh, yeah, go on. That in the US, 13% of all dog bites, that's the second highest, are Labradors. 
Right, okay, so lots of people not very happy with Labradors. you. Labradors. Lots of people not very happy mm -hmm. with you this morning, which we'll come on to. Uh, you know, David and Rene. This one, I'm just repeating, David, did you, and Rene, Rene, did you know the average, Rene, did you know the average number of deaths caused by dogs is less than four per year? No, so that's not true. So in the last eight months, there have been 15. Right, OK. Uh, lots of other messages coming in. I wasn't going to go down that rabbit hole. Battery-driven cars are the worst invention ever. I do not want to waste hours every day recharging batteries. I would rather have a donkey, <laughs> says Maureen. Oh, I think that's a great uh, idea. And Maureen, I think your donkey will be faster than a car is allowed to travel soon. Certainly in London soon or we'll Wales. Or soon we'll have to have someone walking in front of our car with a flag. <laughs> Uh, you know they say history reinvents itself, exactly. and so that is exactly where we were going. We were also talking about the steelworks and Tata and, and what they're doing there and 500 million quid that we're throwing at it. I thought Net Zero was going to provide lots of employment. So why are 3,000 potentially losing their jobs? I don't understand the thinking of the government anymore. Great well, show from my favourite doctors, that's Lynn in Essex. I don't think, thank you Lynn, I don't think anyone understands what's going on in government. And interestingly, I've actually had a message about that saying that the steel that's produced by electric fire furnaces is not actually of a grade high enough to actually be useful to anyone can't be used in weapons for example which is what most of the steel goes to so it's a complete and utter waste of time mm -hmm. and 3,000 people are losing their livelihoods. I, I, I totally I totally uh, I get it um, lots of other messages coming in about all of this um, Angela Rayner oh yeah I'm asking about uh, nicknames for all of the political leaders uh, Angela Rayner's nickname British bully she definitely needs to be muzzled and I'm sure conquers Keir Starmer would put it on for her Angus in Yorkshire one of our regulars thank you very much keep all of those coming in did you have any more on that no no, no one's no one's messaging me on those oh, actually, okay I've got lots more um yeah, I can't read that one. It's too rude. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's move on. Let's move on now and talk about uh, the migration crisis. As you know, this is something I feel very passionate about. The fact is uh, that the government has said it will get on top of the migration issue. We saw 44,000 people coming here illegally last year. Of course, we've got RAF uh, Weathersfield and Scampton. We've got the Bibby Stockholm. And yet still the numbers keep climbing. Now, the, over the last... Um, a couple of days there have been a number of articles about this which is that Suella Braverman has uh, claimed Keir Starmer uh, because he came up with a plan basically he said that actually what we need to do is to get back in bed with the European Union and make sure that we then allocate uh, people who are fleeing water uh, fleeing countries and so on the migrants that are moving around and that essentially we need to share them out well Suella Braverman has claimed that Keir Starmer would make Britain the dumping ground for EU migrants and Labour has accused her of embarrassing nonsense. Here's the details. Sir Keir has indicated a Labour government could be prepared to do a deal with Brussels that would involve the UK taking a quota of asylum seekers who arrive in the bloc in exchange for the ability to return migrants who illegally cross the channel to England. Now the Home Secretary has hit back at this to say that actually this potential deal would mean that something like 100,000 migrants would come into, the, come into the United Kingdom from the EU every single year. And of course that is way in excess of the 44,000 that we saw uh, coming in last year. Well joining me now is uh, Professor Sir John Curtis, Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde. Very good morning to you John. Good morning to you, David. Uh, so this is uh, politically a uh, very hot potato, as you and I know very well indeed. I find this fascinating that Keir Starmer, I think, wants to appear statesmanlike, says we need to re-engage with the EU, will then divvy up the numbers that are arriving. The EU itself has major problems with the migration crisis, and now this has turned into a massive political football. Well, it's become a massive political football for those like you and I who follow politics closely, whether or not this story has landed with quite so much resonance in the wider public, I think is debatable. We've got a little bit of opinion, opinion polling now on how people are reacting to some of this. So, for example, uh, when Find Out Now asked people whether they thought Sir Keir Starmer was too soft or too harsh on immigration, 44% said they didn't know. Coming somewhat, somewhat more closely to the nub of the issue, um, we think also yesterday came out with some polling, which actually is the one poll that's really addressed that the issue you've just pointed to, which is Sakir Starmer's plan to uh, accept uh, a quota of migrants shared up with the European Union in return for us being able to 
uh, return uh, illegal migrants uh, to the UK who are coming across in the boats. Well, again, you know, 33% of people said, I don't know whether this is a good idea or not. That said, uh, it has to be said that this idea on this very early polling has landed perhaps rather better uh, for Labour than the government would have hoped, because amongst those at least who have a view, 43% said, actually, this sounds like quite a good idea, and 25% said it did not. Um, and this, of course, is against a backdrop where other polling this week uh, found that, you know, a record proportion of people, around two-thirds, say they are dissatisfied with the way the current government are handling immigration. And it may well be that one of the problems the Conservatives now have in attacking Labour on this issue is that, you know, whatever the merits or demerits of what Labour are coming up with, because the public are now so unhappy at the way in which the government are dealing with the issue, what the government has to say on this issue is not necessarily going to be believed by the public, including, by the way, uh, many of those who voted Conservative in 2019. I find that absolutely extraordinary that the number of don't knows when this is something that is electorally going to obviously influence the next general election. In terms of the numbers, we've already passed 23,000 into this country. Even the EU, which as you know is kind of my arch nemesis, even the EU has branded Keir Starmer's small boats mm -hmm. policy uh, delusional. So they don't think it will work. I think uh, people like uh, yourself and me who are interested in politics essentially the EU has a track record of not really wanting to cooperate we've spent 500 million quid giving France money that hasn't exactly worked out very well and of course I, I think it's just bonkers to think the EU is going to help the United Kingdom because they don't like the fact we left uh, and so I, I I don't understand the disconnect why is it that people don't know enough about this policy well, it's, it's question, we don't know whether, but well, I mean, the, the honest truth is that most people will not have followed the detail of the policy. They may have just got to the beginning of the headlines. But, I mean, David, I think you just have to remember that public attitudes towards the European Union are not quite where they were. Indeed. Like, with the 2016 EU referendum. And again, you know, one other piece of polling in the last day was, you know, you know, is, is it important for us to cooperate with the European Union and to work with the European Union on immigration? Uh, over 50% of people say it's very important for us to do so. So, you know, whatever the merits of the arguments you're putting forward... Um, the <laughs> you're saying I'm wrong. They're, they're, they're not arguments that are seemingly having resonance for a public, which, of course, has seen... I mean, I mean leaving aside the, the, the immediate issue of illegal immigration, the, the truth is that what the public have seen and now accept has happened is that following leave, uh, our departure from the European Union, immigration, legal immigration, has gone up. Mm. And so, again, you know, this makes it rather more difficult for the government. One thing, by the way, you said, of course, we know that, uh, that illegal immigration is going to be a crucial issue in the election. By no means is this obviously true. If you try to look to see whether or not there is, uh, uh, try to look to see whether or not this is an issue that is causing the Conservatives to lose votes, you discover that it doesn't prove to be very important. Now, the test I use here is, is it the case that those Conservative voters who think the government isn't handling illegal immigration very well, are they more likely to have defected from the Conservatives since 2019 than those who don't take that view? And the answer is no. In the end of the day, the crucial question, the crucial issue that the government has to settle and the issue that is costing the government votes is not immigration, it is the state of the economy. And I think the truth is that until the Conservatives are able to convince the public that they are able to run the economy in the wake of you know, the Liz Truss fiasco, which has done them so much damage, focusing on the issue of illegal, uh, of stopping the votes, is in, in truth probably more successful at pointing at something where the public are doubtful about the government's record rather than something that's necessarily going to prove to be a means of persuading people to vote Conservative once again. I mean, it's interesting, actually. I, I, I think you, what you say makes a lot of sense. Also, just in terms of Starmer and the positioning of the Labour Party, there is no doubt in my mind that they are moving towards the centre ground. In my humble opinion, this is where uh, elections are won and lost. Also, Keir Starmer now looks like he's backpedalling on this idea of giving EU national the vote that was one of the the promises he made some years ago but also I just wonder if in the voters minds and maybe you have some polling do people trust Labour now 
do do they think the Labour Party is going far enough to solve the problems of this country to make it an electable government? Well, I think the answer to that is that on most issues, including, by the way, immigration, the public are more likely to say they think Labour can handle the issue well than the Conservatives. But we should also bear in mind that a lot of people say they're not sure that either of them could do so. So, you know, this takes us back to the broader point that we know about uh, where we're at at the moment, which is the, the public are unhappy about the current government. They mm. say they're willing to vote Labour, but it's not necessarily something they do with enthusiasm or necessarily with high expectations of what Labour uh, might, might achieve. I mean, by the way, I don't think, I mean, you're right to say that Labour are moving towards the centre. The other thing, of course, which is going on, is the Labour Party are realising that we are in a very difficult fiscal situation, that the government has in many respects uh, kicked the can down the road on this until after the general election. And to that extent, at least, they're already beginning to anticipate some of the difficulties they would face if they were to be in government after the election, i.e. if they were to overpromise now, uh, they will create themselves political difficulties thereafter because, uh, frankly, um, as one very famous former chief secretary put it back in 1997, there isn't any money left. <laughs> I remember that very well indeed with the note that was left. Just in terms of the polling, and I looked at a number of polls this morning, it, it seems to me that Labour has, and you can correct me if I am wrong, but just looking across all of these, Labour around 44%, depending on the yeah. poll that you read, I've got Conservatives, anything between 24 and 27%. Is, is, is there much flux going on there? Also, what's happening to the smaller parties? Well, OK, so we're basically, on average, looking at around a 17, 18-point lead. Uh, that is not very different from the lead that Labour had uh, after uh, uh, um, Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister. In short, the Conservatives have made very little progress in the last 12 months at narrowing Labour's lead. And such progress as they had made, and they had made some, was essentially thrown away when the Conservatives failed to get in behind the Privileges Committee report that said that Boris Johnson had misled the House of Commons. In the immediate wake of that, what had got down to a 15-point uh, 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 Labour lead went back actually up to 20 points for a while and is now running at 18. Uh, and you have to remember the, the other issue that the government faces is that Boris Johnson is widely now regarded as somebody who did not tell the truth. He's been uh, uh, acu uh, uh, acu uh, criticised for that by his own peers and the party needs to be able to distance themselves from that and they have failed to do so. Um, uh, so as the smaller parties are concerned, well, reform are certainly still there picking up the votes of some of the people who are uh, in favour of being outside the European Union and are unhappy with the Conservatives. They're running at around 6%. The Greens are still there. So I know the other counterpoint to in the way the Conservatives think they might be able to gain some ground by uh, not being quite so keen on net zero, well, the Greens are picking up around 5 6%. Much of that effectively nibbling at Labour's heels. The Liberal Democrats, well, frankly, they're flatlining. They're at 11%. Mm. It's more or less what they got last time. And I think, for me, in many respects, they ought to be disappointed where they're at because an unpopular Conservative government is usually fertile ground for the, for the Liberal Democrats to prosper. But they haven't been able to prosper from the Conservatives' difficulties during the course of the last 18 months. And so, John, uh, the, the, the big question, I guess, is if you were advising the government, when should the election be? If they, if they hope to cling on to power? Well, I, I think the honest truth is they have to play it long, but at least they have to play it uh, as long as they can decency, decently do so. And I think that points to the last Thursday in October of next year before the clocks go back. Uh, in, in, insisting on election in the dark is perhaps uh, a bit too much, <laughs> but uh, that basically is as long as you can go on for that seems decently reasonable. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your words of wisdom. It's really good to talk to you. As ever, that's Sir John Curtis there, Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde. Really interesting, actually, mm -hmm. because obviously John brought out points I, I don't necessarily agree with, but also I think the migration is a big issue. I think it's massive, and I think the thing is that polling now, it's one of those issues again that people are... Are almost afraid Do you think people don't tell the truth? Yes, because I mm. think they're afraid to say that they want to end this migration because then they're seen as unkind. And this is how it all works. So, and people are shouted at, you know, you're going to let people die. So they, I they guess don't it depends what it. question you're asked as well. 
doesn't it? It's the phrasing yeah. of that question. And as you know, actually, sometimes you get the answers from the... Well, you, 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 you compose the question to get the answers that you're looking for. I don't know. Yeah. And, but the polls, the polls tend to be quite accurate. Well, they don't. They absolutely don't, do right. they? They weren't accurate over Trump winning. They weren't accurate over Brexit. They weren't accurate they over... They definitely weren't about Brexit. Right. They weren't accurate over Boris getting an 80-seat majority. That was also on a knife edge. They weren't accurate as way back as Major in 92, who was going to lose and got, you know, voted back in. So I don't think the polls are accurate, and I think they're becoming mm. less accurate as time goes on, because we've moved into such a divisive society that you're scared to actually say what so, you're So that's really interesting. You know on the exit polls when you voted and you come out and they say, can I ask how you voted, which they're allowed yeah. to do. I don't think many people actually give you the proper no. indication, because as you rightly say, I don't think people want to tell you. And you get sneered at. If, you, if, you, if you're against migration, if you're for Brexit, you're an unintelligent, right-wing, racist bigot. Mm. So why would you admit to being a unintelligent, right-wing, racist bigot? Um, yeah, well, thank you very much indeed, Brené. Very quickly, we need to go to a break. Uh, good morning, Doctors. I'm asking about caricatures of uh, the uh, the main political leaders. Uh, good morning, Doctors. How about talk TV presenters as characters? Ian Collins should be James Bond. Oh, my word. Yeah. Mike Graham and Kevin O'Sullivan, Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, Piers Morgan, The Godfather. Okay. James Max Yoda is not going to like that at all. Christo is Jim Royal. <laughs> Oh, I don't know who Jim Royal is. From the royal family, I think. Oh, yeah. I've never watched No, no, it. but very funny. Simon in Hull, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Time for a break. After the break, uh, it's head to head. Joining us this morning, Samara Gill, TikTok creator and political commentator, and Jonathan List, journalist and also political commentator. This is Talk TV.
back to Weekend Breakfast. The time, 8.25 now on Saturday, September the 16th. I'm David Ball. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your company. Now, I've been asking about uh, who, do you, who do you think these politicians represent? So uh, we've been talking about Rishi Sunak, of course, inaction man, Keir Starmer, uh, being, um, act, uh, be, being uh, Ken, of course, because he has no balls, <laughs> according to Penny Morden. Uh, this one, Sadiq Khanna, is, is the Uncle Festa. Thank you for that, Donna, in Birmingham. Uh, lots of other messages coming in. There's one about uh, my next guest actually. Dan in Kent says Jonathan List reminds me of Neil from The Young Ones and on that oh, note... Is that a compliment? Uh, no. And on funny. that note it's time for Head to Head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, joining us this morning, Samara Gill, TikTok creator and political commentator, and Jonathan List, journalist and political commentator. Good morning to the two of you. Good morning. Good what morning. do you normally get, Jonathan? Bradley, Bradley Cooper. Cooper. Or Joel Donnett sometimes. Yeah, what can I say? <laughs> I don't mind being slightly Thank uglier you. and I would Yes, start. I do. Say, I once had an entire bus chanting Bradley at me, and they thought they were being. I thought I've never been so complimented in my entire life. Well, that is Blimey. Quite, yeah. Yeah, quite yeah. a compliment, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And Samara, thank you so much for coming in because I know you, we didn't give you much notice. So, um, no problem at all. No, I'm happy to come on. Really in. good. And this is going to be very interesting dynamic and I can't wait. Um, let's start, if we, we can, with the migrant crisis. I was talking to Professor Sir John Curtis just before the break. Now, I found this really fascinating because he said, I said, this is going to be a major issue when it comes to uh, the election and the way that people will vote. He said that I was misguided in that. And I find that extraordinary. And this is basically based on, as you know, Keir Starmer, who believes he's come up with the, the idea here. So the idea to stop the, the illegal migrants coming over to this country is to work closely with the EU and therefore we'll take our fair share of the numbers coming in and on the back of that it's believed that we could then take 100,000 uh, into this country uh, that Germany currently takes 25% of migrants coming in so the UK would be in line to take quite a, a percentage of those. Now remember last year was 44,000 so in fact Starmer's own idea would mean more illegal migrants coming to this country what do you make of that, David? Let's let's just go, go back on one thing you just said. If a government allows something, by definition, it's not illegal. This absurd construct that the Conservatives have come up with that the Labour is going to be allowing the illegal migration. Uh, well, if the government so they'll make it legal something. In the, in the sense so, that most migration to this country is in fact illegal. We, we say legal. The majority. Is, is is the majority. The yes, majority but does Starmer know migrations. how to read a room, let alone a country? I mean, it, clearly that's not what we want at the moment. That's literally. That's we are full to the brim. Legal migrants, we had 606,000 net last right. year. So do we really want to add 100,000 okay, on well, top of that? First of all, that was, that was an unusual year because of all the people coming from Hong Kong and also a number of students. It was boosted by a number of, number of things. But you know, it is ironic. And Ukraine. It is and exactly and Ukraine. And it is, of course, ironic that sort of after Brexit we have sort of peak migration, which is in itself a kind of irony given. But, but well, you've just argued it's but, not coming um, from the, anyway. I, but I also want to add to that every country in Europe has seen peak migration. We saw scenes from Lampedusa this week with six thousand people arriving. I, I'm going to I'm, gla I'm glad so, you brought up Lampedusa. Yeah. So the situation on Lampedusa is apocalyptic, according yeah. to a local priest. This is a scrap of territory lying between Tunisia and Sicily. It has a population of 6,000. They've had 7,000 asylum seekers arriving in the last 48 okay, so hours. Really so there's a lot of people on the move across, the, across the world and into Europe. The question is, is it the UK's problem? Is it the Euro Europe's problem? The EU itself cannot cope. Oh, well, that's, well, I don't think that's true that the EU cannot cope. There are some countries in the EU that are doing their bit, such as Germany, and there are other countries in the EU, such as Hungary, that want nothing to do with any of it. And that is a problem that the EU is having to solve. Look, you have, in a way, the Lampedusa question is a quite an interesting microcosm. Because if you were someone living on Lampedusa, you'd be looking... Uh, which, as you know, it has a very small population and a lot of migrants because it is so close to Africa. You'd be looking at other sort of, sort of land masses, not necessarily, you know, even the Italian mainland, and thinking, wait, well, you know, we can't cope. So it's only fair that you should be um, taking your fair share of, of these people and processing their claims, mm -hmm. etc. But, you know, that, you know, technically Lampedusa, you might argue, is a safe, is a, is a safe place. 
you know, so that you, so other countries, you know, might be taking Britain's attitude and saying, well, you know, Lampedusa's safe, you should be staying in Lampedusa. No, which, I, if I, you I were in Lampedusa, think, I, don't would fair, be, I don't think any fair minded it's, it's, person. But this is illustrating the problem, though, that actually people should be taking their fair share. It shouldn't just be the responsibility of the first country that people arrive in. And that's the fundamental flaw with this argument. The people in Britain saying, not our problem, you've gone through but another we, safe country. We are not in the EU. The EU is also in denial that it can cope, clearly. I mean, there's a real denial factor here they are saying yes you can come and you can have status and everything like that but they clearly can't with this scenario that we've just seen this week they cannot handle the levels of migration that they've agreed to do they're in denial about it and they need to stop and we're not in the eu and thank god we're actually putting our foot down and saying we can't do this but starmer clearly has no idea of what the country actually wants so can i just ask you though just ju just in terms and the numbers are staggering eight hundred eighty-one thousand asylum seekers now across europe uh, Germany takes 25%, France takes 16%, Spain 12%, as you rightly say, Jonathan, other countries not wanting to play ball, and you can understand why. But also the UK would be on, on the hook to take a, a significant proportion of those. Just in terms of this, I'm deeply nervous. This is Keir Starmer sidling up to the EU, trying to get back in with the EU. This is a pathway back into the European Union, and, and um, the, the Labour Party denies that, and I can see Jonathan shaking his head, but Samara... No, this is them sidling up and going back into the EU. I mean, just this week, he's backpedalled on giving EU migrants the vote, if we saw that headline too. No, that's I mean, not true. That's he has. Well, when has he said that? He said he would give EU migrants the vote a, a couple of years ago. Yeah, he well, has when now he said not it now? put it in the policy document. So, in, so, so it in, is not. So actually, so the opposite of what you're saying. No, no, she no said she's he right. Backpedaled. So he is no longer doing it. Yes, but then that's the opposite of going back but, into the EU, isn't it? No, no. So basically, what he's what, what Samara is saying that he is he's changing with the wind again. That's oh, oh well, that, we can, well, that we can all agree yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, clearly, Starmer is not a conviction politician. I mean, right. that we can all agree on. Yeah, and he's not, actually. He's just basically lots of quotes. I'm in opposition. I'm not in a position to negotiate that. And then on the burden of migrants, he said a returns agreement would be helpful, but that would have to be negotiated. He's very, like, for someone who really has such strong sort of of course that has been negotiated. I mean, look, you can't possibly say what you're going to agree with uh, another polity you know, before you've even been put into office. Clearly, you know, that's what the government was saying all, all the while. He's so wishy-washy. We need to know what we're voting well, well, for no, and but, he's not standing strong he's on actually, anything. Well, actually, you might, you could, even, you know, even as his opponent, you might actually give him a little bit of credit for at least proposing something and at least revealing something well, with his plans so, so how do, on how migration because we are all out of ideas on this well you know i've put forward uh, an alternative proposal many times on this program which is to you know sort of open processing centers in france for example which would eliminate mm -hmm. uh the need for I think everyone those, uh, illegal, well, well apart from the government but you know if you if you have processing well, centers they, in no, france to the government, they seem to have safe and legal routes and to have those safe and legal routes because there aren't safe and legal routes so, right but now but this goes back to the bigger issue the illegal migration bill has passed they have come up with a plan with scampton with weathersfield with the bb stockholm with rwanda which has been blocked by a pajama injunction but also when the eu is Itself. And, and how do you answer this? So Keir Starmer's new small boats plan bombed within hours. The Eurocrats in the EU said it's delusional. Well, like, I think well, I read the Sun piece that was uh, that, that, that was had it. that, and there was one EU official um, who said. And that the EU needs to get its house in order. Well, okay, fine. Uh, when Ursula von der Leyen says it's delusional, like you know Jean Claude Juncker used to say, Theresa May's plans were delusional all the time on the record. Then we can talk about it. But the fundamental problem, the fundamental point here, David, is mm. that clearly this is a problem. Everyone agrees the problem. Everyone uh, is coming up with different solutions or none. Rwanda, you know, I think it's an abhorrent policy, but it is currently blocked and pending uh, appeal in the Supreme Court and um, based on so the, the Which human is, rights. Which is, I Act. think, next month. Well, 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 we'll see what happens with that. In a way, the government, I think, would rather like it to the Supreme Court to agree that it's unlawful so they don't actually have to go through with it and then prove to everyone how it's actually not a workable, sustainable policy mm. in the long term. It's okay. incredibly expensive. But leaving that to one side, Starmer is saying yeah, that the he cost wants to micro negotiate enormous, something. Look, we have something. We have still this attitude with, with the EU, this cakeist approach that says we can get everything we want and we're not going to shoulder any kind of compromise or any kind of burden at all. Well, we but get the EU, Wait, we gave France. France 500 million quid. But when and also, we're not part of the EU anymore. We don't owe them anything. Well, well if, you go to negotiate, the if you're going to negotiate yeah. with someone, then clearly you're going to have to Samara's give and take. right. We've left.
Yeah, well, we don't well, owe them any money, it. anything, and that was the whole point. And I well, we do think, owe them money, that's why we're paying a massive bill. Yeah, I also think, Jonathan, nobody can say that we've taken all the best bits that we want from Europe and, and put <laughs> and it away. We've, got, deal, we've got almost nothing, we've got a rubbish deal. <laughs> well, I mean, I if we, if we really well. wanted to play hardball, we would have said to France, right, you can't have any fishing licences until you sort out the migrant problem. Yeah, well, well, good luck selling. Well, let's not talk about fishing because then we wouldn't have been able to sell any of our fish into the EU, which is where most of our fish goes. So let's put that on. We should eat the fish and be healthier. Well, I mean, if you want to have a conversation about whether people well, should be eating herring so, and mackerel we can talk so, about so that fishing, but it's like is fishing is complicated and i think the government sold us out on the fishing licenses i think june mummery would agree with that who who is very good on on that topic just in terms of, of labor and i was talking to john curtis about this and clearly labor is in the lead mm. he said something quite interesting that people are resigning themselves to voting labor it's it's sort of the least worst option mm. When I was reading about Labour's election promises, she talks about, uh, Angela Rayner talks about winning over voters, strengthening workers' rights. It's about a uh, new deal for working people, protections against unfair dismissal, a ban on zero hour contracts, more flexible working, and ending so called fire and rehire practices. Is that sexy enough? Is the Labour Party giving me an inspiration? Is Am I thinking, yes, it's let's go? Absolutely not. And actually, if you look into it, the New Deal for working people, which it's kind of been called as this marketing spin on it, it's actually getting rid of a lot of things like the zero hour contracts are actually very helpful for workers. Because for some then, workers. Yeah, for some workers, not but all. then they can choose their, their hours and they can work as much as they want to work instead of being sort of, you know, restricted to a certain number. So it looks like it's good for workers but really when you look into it it's getting rid of a lot of good policies mm. Jonathan is it exciting enough the vision from Labour no not yet uh, look let's be pragmatic about this um, to win an election government the government's firstly lose elections and to win mm. it you simply mm. have to be slightly less awful than your <laughs> opponents and and, and yeah. Labour is. Labour is significantly less awful than yeah, opponents, I agree. Uh, and it's uh, obviously coming from the left. I would like it to be a lot more radical. I would like what Starmer. Would you, what would well, you I would like Starmer to actually just agree with Starmer and say that what he did three years ago, which was the 2017 manifesto, was, I think, the foundational document for Labour's um, platform so, so what, why going is, forward. So why, why is Starmer having an identity crisis? Is it because he's being pulled into the middle by because Blair he's and terrified, people like that? Because he's terrified of losing. He's terrified, no, he's terrified of lots of things. He's gripped by fear. He's afraid of the right-wing media. He's afraid of tabloid editors. He's afraid of, what, the Mail and Telegraph. He thinks that um, this is not in the bag, Well, he worries it's not in the bag, much as Tony Blair did, in fact, in the mid-90s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole sort of metaphor about sort of, you know, walking with a Ming vase on a, on a shiny floor, I think Roy Jenkins said. Mm. So that's very much Starmer's thing. He thinks, you know, he could, you know, everything is to lose as far as he's concerned. That sounds like great characteristics for the new Prime Minister well, of the look, United Kingdom. Uh, Honestly, I mean, look, like, could, really, that sounds could, like, wow, I really want him to be, be leading the free world. Than what we've, well, I mean, I don't think the British Prime Minister has led the free world for a number of years. <laughs> well, you thank know what God, I mean. Thank God. I mean, there, there are some lovely lines in this particular article, I don't know whether I found this, in the week, uh, that, that Keir Starmer basically is, is wooing corporate leaders with a smoked salmon and scrambled egg offensive. I think that's it's probably... my favourite breakfast. Well, 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 but it is, it is, it's bang on. And, and it, also Sharon Graham, the General Secretary of Unite, actually accused Labour of being a 90s tribute act to former Prime Minister Tony Blair. Yes, there there is an element of that, I think. Let's move on, though. Ex-Foreign Office Mandarin Lord MacDonald admits he openly told colleagues he voted Remain after finding fellow officials in tears after the Brexit vote. I was horrified by this because, of course, you can have personal opinion. But I thought the whole point of the civil service was to be impartial. But, David, come on. David. Let's, let's not reach the spelling salts too quickly, shall we? Look, <laughs> we can have a conversation about the foreign policy establishment and how you'd expect most people in the foreign policy establishment to vote to remain in the EU. But the fact is, whether you agree with that or not, the fact is that everyone knew that most people in the Foreign Office would be voting to remain. And so when you have those people now being recruited into sort of, you know, implementing policy they didn't want, I actually think it was quite sensible for the head of that institution to tell his colleagues, I didn't want this, but now I we're see. going to implement it. You know, we, I understand you put your feelings to one side. I didn't vote for this, but we could put our feelings to one side and now we do what we've been tasked by the British people. I think that was actually right. And there's a difference between impar impartiality doesn't mean not having any opinions. It means in, the t in terms of the civil service, offering impartial advice to ministers, which ministers can choose to accept or refuse.
Dr. Dr. Rennie, I can see you glowering well, at me. Well, because I'm just thinking about that, and I actually I understand what you're saying and why you're saying it. But then, if you look at our, we go back just briefly to the um, immigration policy. We know that most people in the Home Office actually feel that we should have open doors and letting everyone in, and that shows in our figures. And it does show in our figures. Open doors, come on, no one now, thinks we Jonathan, should have open doors. We are accepting something like 87% of all applications, where other countries. But in that's the because UK, they're doing it by Zoom. They're not actually. Well, no, it's you because see they, that questionnaire. It's because they don't want to turn people. People down. Agreed. So What's they're not being EU? impartial What's that because the they're EU? not being impartial. The Home Office. I don't think you can accuse the Home Office of being, you know, of being friendly no, to I really, migrants. No, I really. I dubbed my own partner, and he's Russian, and he got a visa in two days to stay in this country. I mean, that's like you know. Well, that's, you, want, that's, well you would want your partner to make things worse. Honestly, yes. Uh, <laughs> my partner is treated so well by the Home Office. Damn them. But it's pretty crazy. I mean, that is the state. That is kind of the state of what's going I, on. I, I mean, really, that, really yeah. maybe he just had a yeah. really good visa application. And the Home Office wasn't raised. I mean, that's probably a quite good thing, isn't it? Yes, but I mean, it's it's. I mean, kind you could of... argue it's efficient. Yeah, it's efficient. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that, I mean any <laughs> when anyone tells me a story of the Home Office being efficient, I mean, I kind of normally I kind of like race to say we need to abolish the Home Office. I mean, great if they actually managed to approve a visa that was sort of you know sort of uh, you know. No, we know they're not efficient. We know that they've got a wait backlog. Yeah, they do. Of course, we know this. Of course. But we also know that those who they process mainly get approved. So there's almost no point in the process. Yes, that's, that's not true. I, mean, I think it's seventy five percent. And you know, you can't. You, you know, we have to agree, support the process as it exists. You know, if if um, these uh, Home Office civil servants are supporting people's asylum claims, um, then presumably um, they had a good claim to be here. I mean, I don't think no, we need. To, well, I'm look, not I mean, to accept that. well, I mean, fine. Well, then we'll disagree, <laughs> disagree on that. I mean, we don't know what happens in that room. Talking about a great... Sorry, Samara, final word on No, it. no, I just don't know why we're still even talking about who voted yes, who voted no for this whole thing. We just need to move on and unify. That's It's as simple as that. I mean, I think I think Jonathan actually gave it a nice spin, that, because what, I read it differently. I read it that the Remain uh, the Remain mandarins actually do everything they can to thwart the process. No. And you read it a different no. way, which, it, which is intriguing true. in itself. I'll tell you what, you're doing so well. Let's keep you where you are. Samara Giller, Jonathan Liss, uh, they're on head-to-head... Let's take a break. After the break, they'll be back. They're so good. This is Talk TV. <laughs> good evening. I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Stop working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Is he making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability. We need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I obviously wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Uh, yes. Labour absolutely. 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, in the polls. No, no, can Come we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs and they bent the rules or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unravelled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off short. <laughs> <in> this <laughs> <laughs> oh, Get out. Mark, Get Get out. Out. Mark. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps>
So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? <laughs> If it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast, the time 8.45 now on Saturday, uh, September... Will you behave, please? September the uh, 16th. Uh, Jonathan Liss says, says Leighton, uh, said Keir Starmer is frightened of everything. Do we really want a leader who's scared of his own shadow? Uh, how about Dr René as Cruella de Vil? <laughs> <laughs> That's really good, I like that. You should see it when she gives me those sort of strange eyes when she's angry <laughs> um lots of other messages uh, coming in as well um I'll, I'll go through some of those in just a minute i'm um, joining us this morning samara gill tiktok creator and political commentator and jonathan Liss, journalist and political commentator too lots of other messages are coming in lynn says all this talk on solutions regarding immigration shows we're not a sovereign country that we voted for no more send them back bill in cheshire says as a retired military veteran patriot and proud uk citizen people like jonathan Liss make me physically sick with anger he is a typical lefty liberal londonite who has never and will never offer this country anything but subservience to the uh, Why are you EU. Margaret we, we, we are doomed as a country. Respond, Jonathan Liss. Respond, Jonathan Liss. <laughs> We're not sovereign anymore. I Honestly, I don't know what to say to that. Uh, I, I have a difference of opinion. I think that's a bit harsh because I think you're right. I think we all need difference of opinions. Otherwise, we're yeah, all like, it doesn't make me any less British or anything no, like that. No, no, even no. London is not a crime. You know, it's not. We're, London is the capital city of our great nation. <laughs> and people from London are entitled to their opinions. Of course. Uh, yes. Everybody's in touch with their opinions. In, indeed. Let, let's just move on, if I may, and just start talking about the NHS, which is something we talk about a great deal of of course, uh, Rishi Sunak has set himself some very difficult targets, I think, which was eliminating all weights by 18 months by April, uh, all weights uh, over 12 months by March 2025. Uh, I'm really struck by just how dreadful these targets are. Ridiculous. A, a poverty of aspiration. We should have no waiting list. Uh, just in terms of that, and we have a junior doctor strike which is taking place, a concerted junior doctor strike with the consultant strike. Rennie and I spoke about it this morning, saying we both feel that this is totally unacceptable. It's deeply political, and, and I don't think it should be allowed to happen. Juniors and senior doctors walking out at the same time. Look, uh, we've, we've discussed strikes many, many times together. We have. And the fundamental, look, the fundamental, and a, and a kind of binary of a strike, if you like, is on the one hand, no one sets out to make their service users lives worse you know people service don't want, well, well, I'm, I'm using well, it like for trains oh, trains okay. whatever the strike okay. is i'm so you know making it broad <laughs> no one sets out to make the people that they are that they work to serve worse on the other hand a strike doesn't mean anything if you don't show the value of the labor being withdrawn and so if you're trying to make your point obviously you need to illustrate how important you are so that people will listen to you and listen to your demands. Even if people die? Well, I don't... Well, that's the fundamental thing. I don't know... No one is going to... Sort of, I think that you, emergency care is not going to be withdrawn from anyone. I think it's kind of, you know... But if to, you haven't got anyone on the ward, you can't admit. So a and &E will get stuffed. Yeah, Obviously, like, I'm not saying there aren't going to be problems. I very much hope that no one's going to die. And I think that, you know, even well, during will, the nurses' will strike, die. even yeah. in the nurses' strike that you had a couple of months ago, no, and nurses break their own strike when someone collapsed in front of them. Yeah, yeah. These people, you know, these people are programmed to help people. But at the same time, they feel they've been shafted by the government and they want to, to, to so, make a point so, about so it. So, Samara. Yes, yeah, so the junior doctor strike specifically, I think, is really selfish. I mean, I'm friends with a few junior doctors myself, and I just do think, is it a cost of living crisis thing or is it cost of lifestyle crisis for you? Because I don't see that they're really handling, you know, they, their wages are well enough. And I think when they're in university, they're promised buckets of cash from their profession. And then when they get to it, they don't understand that you have to work your way up from the bottom to the top in order to be earning those, you know, vast amounts of money that they were promised to 
initially. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Both Vivek Trivedi and Rob Lawrenson are very junior doctors. They haven't actually done much at all in terms of the health service. The, the one thing they would fire back at that is that they have a debt of 100,000, say, at the end of their medical training. They need to pay it back. They'll, they'll take a very long time to pay it back. There is also a very interesting article um, I mentioned earlier, actually, if I can find it. James Nafano has written about this. Just what, what does this say about, about the, the, the status of the, of the doctor, I think, in society? I mean, it says that they are no longer sort of the, at least the junior ones I'm really talking about, the ones who haven't done their time in the wards yet. It means that they're not just in it for helping people. They are really also in it for the cash effect. Do, and do I you think, think we're recruiting the wrong people into med school? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's so many of my friends that wanted to be in med school, just didn't get the grades by a couple of points, and they were the people who were more perfect, opposed to the ones who just read the things and wrote, learned, and don't really have much empathy, but did it to impress their parents or did it for, again, you know, the cash payment that they think they were going to get every month for being a doctor. See, I, I'm going to... I'm going to disagree with you on several bits Fair here. Enough. So I certainly didn't see people in medical school who were in it for the money. They were in it because they loved medicine, and I'm going to say that. But However, I think things have changed. Maybe things have changed, but I have a bigger problem with the consultants. I like, do, and too. And I do that's the why, juniors. That's why I was surprised you totally said... Totally get where you're coming from. But I think the consultant thing is far... You're far less able to stand behind the consultants when they they want a 35% pay uplift, and actually they're earning 134000 plus private work. No, the NHS needs to be completely restructured. And if, if they do want a small pay rise, the junior doctors and the senior doctors, then we need to get rid of all those management structures. Well, they're being offered 9%. Yeah, then I agree. And that's the, and the, NHS, the, the NHS can't survive without administration. I mean, no, but twenty percent of of their staff now is uh, administration. Oh, no, no, no forty eight. Well, in forty. The, well, it depends yeah. who you read, but yes, I mean, it's far too many. I mean, but, I think we'll everyone agree. agrees that the NHS needs reform. The only question yeah. is how it gets reformed. Well, no one, no one, no political party is bold enough to do it, is it? Are they? That's the problem. Well. I mean, clearly, the NHS is failing right now, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. on its knees, and they've, everyone can They've agree. had more money everyone, than they've ever had, well, so... Well, it's not. It's about the resources, it's about staffing, it's about equipment, it's about so many things, and obviously you can have money and not spend it well, um, And but clearly there does need to be more money, and we have an ageing population, and it's going to get worse, and I think that we're going to be in for a, a hellish winter. You know, the, the, we the, said the, that, the, we've the, said that the, for The canaries years. in the coal mine are there, and you know, we've got COVID mm. back on the rise, so, you know, it, it might be, and that's going to, you know, also send be so, a real uh, political problem for the Conservatives as well. Well, I think, for, and, and if Labour does get into power, they're going to inherit one big mess here. Of course they are, on also, every level. I mean, it's really interesting because we, one of the things that's uh, hit back, you know, I'm very, very aware that, for example, in Australia, uh, you don't wait because you can get no. seen by a doctor. Just explain, because you are originally from Australia. Yes. That system, just explain the Australian system. I mean, the Australian system is really, it's really good. Um, you Basically, it's private and public alongside each other, and they do subsidise each other, basically, if that makes any sense. So there are no wait lists. Um, so you can see a doctor immediately? Absolutely. Okay. France as well and Spain, all of these countries. But yes. just, so, right, and so see, places like that, Holland, etc. Yeah. Yes, you can see a doctor immediately. There are no wait lists. But that's also, I mean, I hate to go into immigration, but we really have much lower numbers of people. Because they turn in, the boats back. Yes, completely. So we've got on um, it kind of works on all levels it's not just because we have such a great healthcare system it's because we also have allocated enough hospital beds allocated enough doctors to actually fulfill the amount of people we have in our country so, so, so if we so, turned back all the migrants in this country we wouldn't have an NHS well, to, well, to, well let's you know, go let's, well you could have legal true, migration so yeah, that's not true, true. Huh? and let's just go back to that bigger point <laughs> isn't it time to say that the, our system doesn't work and everyone says oh it's marvellous well th there's a reason no one says it's marvellous no but there's a reason that no other country has followed us because it doesn't work. Well, I mean, it has worked in the past. Days. Yes, but medicine has moved on. So back in the day, if you had a heart attack, you would be in bed rest for five days. Now we don't. You give you an angiogram, an angioplasty. You have dr different drugs. We are now having immunotherapy. We're keeping people alive much longer. It all costs a lot more money. That's good, well, isn't it? It's really good, but it's just unsustainable. It's unsustainable. If it's free we have a much, in terms of the model. We have a much less healthy population. That is it's also why true. Western countries did so badly in COVID, because we had people that were obese with multiple comorbidities. And so that really 
took its effect with low vitamin D as well. But I think that the issue here is that the irony of these doctors going on strike is many of them really resist any change to the NHS towards an insurance-based system, for example, but they're quite happy to up sticks to Australia where there is an insurance-based system yes. and benefit from and that. And that's what so we heard. So there is a hypocrisy. It's not going to turn into America overnight. I can confirm it as really an Australian. Isn't. It's not going to be that way if we go into the Australian system and we model our NHS. So you that. see a very distinct difference between that and the American system. Yeah. Oh, it's big. I mean, there's no one that comes out of hospital with a $100,000 bill after staying there for four days. Mm. That would you welcome? No one, no one wants the US system. No. No, but would you welcome a, a hybrid system like Australia? I think the fundamental um, principle of the NHS is it has to be free at yeah. uh, the point of, of use for everyone. And that but it that's shouldn't not be true driven, in Australia, is it? You, get, you do have to pay some sort of consultation fee, do you? If you have... No. A no, it's an you insurance don't. Okay. card, and it doesn't cost right. much. Okay, no, so you, no. Right, okay, so you... Right, I mean, I suppose, though, I mean, technically, you know, anyone who, who works is paying national insurance, which goes you know, specifically mm -hmm. towards yes. the health service anyway. Um, but I think that the problem that people have is where you have um, companies that are for-profit um, kind of uh, working in the NHS, and that is, you know, I have I have mixed opinions on that. I interviewed Rachel Clark uh, from a magazine a few months ago, and she was saying the most important thing is about... Um, the outcomes for the patients at the end of the day. And so I asked her, well, in that case, you know, if you are having um, some private companies, uh, you know, sort of helping in that or delivering some of that care, mm. but the patients aren't seeing any, aren't, aren't sort of having to, to pay anything, then why would that not be a solution? And she said, you know, when you have the fundamental issue about companies looking after to being concerned with profits, about making money, rather than having the patient oh, as the, the flip first side concern. of that is they are much leaner, they're very mm -hmm. fast. If you look at private hospitals, they operate on far more yeah. patients. So, and they're because competitive. The three, and they're competitive and their throughput's much higher. So in my GP practice this week, I could get your back seen by a spinal surgeon within 12 days at my local private hospital a year in my NHS. I could get you a scan in yeah. three days, eight weeks on the NHS. These are private providers. Well, everyone, agrees that, everyone agrees that people who can pay, who can afford no, no, no. to pay but for... These are private providers into the NHS. So I can get you NHS service from a private provider at a and tenth why is of the that? way. Why? Because they're efficient, they're quick, they see more patients in a day. They actually are geared up to it. There isn't a culture that we don't seem to be able to chip away at in the NHS about the way we work. Yes, because of the monopoly that the NHS has on healthcare, there's nothing it's competing well, it against, have a and that's well, it why it doesn't have a monopoly. As we just established, I mean, there are private, there are private. But it does have a monopoly because it controls all the money, so it does go yeah. through, and then everything feeds off it. Look, I mean, look, I think fundamentally we have to accept that you know there are private um, providers. I think that the, the most important principle should be obviously outcomes for patients and patients not having to pay, and people having sort of you know equality of service around the country. Those are the most important principles. Mm. You know, then we can sort of you know get into more in the idea ideology that after that but that is the most important thing right agree. now i don't disagree with that i think that should be the principle mm. we've, we've discussed this we free have. at the point of contact and outcome driven i would agree also outcome driven not target driven mm -hmm. and that's where the whole thing went wrong thank you very much indeed to both of you that was uh, fantastic you. samara gill there tiktok creator and political commentator and jonathan this journalist and a political commentator and that was today's head to head head to head and, of course, that comes on the back, uh, René. I'm just very minded that, of course, we have a train driver's strike as well. Do you think that's political, René? Um, the fact is that they're walking out when? The 29th of September for five days from the 2nd to the 6th, of course. Oh, what's Ooh, going on there? Yeah, what's going on there? Oh, the Conservative Party conference. Do you think that's political? Mm. Just a tad, I think. I mean, it's interesting, actually, in terms... Uh, I'm glad Jonathan's gone because he would get very cross with me for this. <laughs> but, um, you know, just in terms of the rail... rail I think it's a pretty good wage. Look, a train. We, we've had this conversation about train drivers who earn more than junior doctors most of the time. Um, and I don't think the job is as challenging. I might be wrong, but I think probably I would want my junior doctor earning more than a train driver. <laughs> probably. Good morning, doctors, says Tony in Harlow. People will die because of these doctors. It's not just about emergency care. Many people who have potential life-threatening conditions are not being treated. The doctors really need to remember why they went into medicine. This is all political and, frankly, they should hang their heads in shape. I do think, René, there is a cultural difference 
uh, here in terms of the way that doctors think now, the way we did as well. Of course, the, under the European Working Time Directive, the hours were capped. I think there is an issue which we spoke about, about recruitment. There I, is, but also I think doctors are not treated as well. I so would I agree with that. I would agree with that as well. It's also about having on call low. rooms, making sure that you've got hot food, all the stuff that we talk about all the time. Thank you very much uh, as well. After the break, we're going to be talking about something that's happened to me. This is about identity threat, the number of people who are being brought into scams. This is Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Straight talking, no nonsense, and annoying all the right people. This is Talk TV. Just when I was getting used to my show, what just happened being on talk TV every Friday night at 10.30, they go and change it. I'm furious. They've moved it to 8.30 every Friday. Talk TV, what just happened? I am furious. A very good morning to you. It's just after nine o'clock now, already on Saturday, September the 16th. I'm David Bull. This is Weekend Breakfast. Thank you very much indeed for your company. Well, you're waking up to great news, news of monumental significance, of course, because it is National Guacamole Day. Oh. Oh, yes. It is also the Forty Towers weekend, uh, kicking off in Dorking. Now, Sybil, that's enough. <laughs> Sybil, that's enough. Just so brilliant, just so brilliant. And Mickey Rourke, star of Nine and a Half Weeks, turns 71 today. Hip, hip! Hooray! 
Hip, hip, hooray, indeed. Right, let's move on to the fascinating facts. Today's fascinating facts. And today, Dr. Rennie, I've remembered to ask you what they are. <laughs> <laughs> so I quite like today's first yeah. fascinating fact. So in 1888, sorry, 1488. The 1485, but 85, okay. The um, beef eaters yes. were established. These are the yeomen at the Tower of London. Yeomen warders, I yes. I love the Tower of London. It's my most favourite building in the country. When I was younger and I was in St John Ambulance, <laughs> I was a sergeant, I'll have you know, and we used to do duty at the Tower of London and get to go behind the scenes and look at the dungeons no. and things that people so, so I live not, not, not far from the Tower of London. I keep going past it thinking I've got to go beautiful. in. Beautiful. Have you never been? Yeah, when I was a kid. Ah, beautiful. And so much history. Mm. So many people went through those gates and didn't come out mm. the other side. So I love that. And it is actually, I didn't know this, you taught me this this morning, that the um, beef eaters are actually all armed forces retirees. They mm. have to have had 22 years mm. service mm. and medals of valour and distinguished service. Mm. Mm. Amazing. And, and they live in the Tower. They live there. And they've got little houses in the town. I know. It's amazing. Absolutely fantastic. So I love that. Right, next fact. one. Then we have the 1888, which is where I got my dates modeled up. And Walter Bentley was born. Yeah. Who obviously um, was the car Designer. dynasty, yeah, as it yeah, were. Yeah, yeah. And then in 1968, we introduced first class and second class stamps. Um, so there were two levels in of when? postage. 1968, the Very year after good. I was born. Yeah. And um, you're that old. I'm afraid so. <laughs> and I'm a it used to work. You know, if you posted a first class letter, it would get there the next day. But if you posted second class, it would be two to three days. Now it doesn't <laughs> work because you hopefully it will be delivered at some point in the future. Well, so so really interesting on that because um, it's now one pound ten for a first class stamp. That's just really expensive. Well, also, if you send fifty Christmas cards, let's just say it's fifty quid. You've not got fifty friends. No, you're right. I haven't. Uh, those are today's fascinating facts. <laughs> Today's so, so rude, so rude. Uh, David, David, can you please let Samara Gill know that I'm in love with her? <laughs> wow. Samara, <laughs> you've pulled. Uh, you and Dot Rene never fail to make me laugh every single weekend <laughs> from Paul in Southampton. Thank you very much indeed. Paul, um, I'm just gonna, looking over to see if I can see Samara's face. Uh, she... <laughs> It's a mixture of delight and horror. I'm not sure which it is, but anyway, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Jonathan Liss brings out Tourette's in me. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Uh, doctors become doctors to make money. No. Uh, times have changed. You're both such nice people, you cannot imagine this about a voca being a vocational profession. I think what he means is that people used to go into it to, for caring, and I still think they do. Oh, I do too. I still think there is, a, there is an element where the application process is wrong. It goes on academic grades far too much, and I think back in, certainly when I went, I wouldn't have got in on that, um, it went on what sort of a person it was as well as well, your academic Firstly, grades. you would have got in because they've dumbed down A-level a so much you would have got in. How rude. S but secondly, it's not just about people with the right grades not getting in. Medical schools are oversubscribed by 13 times, so many kids with four A-star A-levels, yeah. or I think you can get an A-star star now or something ridiculous like that, are not getting in. It's a real shame, and 25% drop out after year one. That again is another problem as well. Let's uh, let's take a call. Actually, sorry, uh, um, obviously head to head ran over, so we haven't had many calls uh, this morning. In fact, I haven't had any. Christopher Zinken, good morning. Yes, good morning, uh, David and Rennie. Morning. morning. Um, it's it's always difficult because you, as you know, you spend a little bit of time in the queue and you're listening to many different uh, issues, and I'm tempted to spread my um, words of, dare I say, wisdom about many, but it's it's purely the issue of, of the illegal uh, immigration, David. I have actually emailed you. I don't know whether you're probably extremely busy enough time to read, but it's it's not a new idea. Frankly, I just feel that for the society to have any sort of uh, um, inspiration and feeling that they're having some bearing on the matter, why don't we organise a national petition to bring the navy into the you know into the equation and have some real sense put into you know where we're going to go with this because there's so many issues going on so much faffing around and mm. you know Keir Starmer with his uh, latest notion which he'll don't, no doubt flip flop what do you, you know and Chris, what crazy, do you, so, Chris no what course. do you envisage the navy doing if we bring them into the melee well First of all, as you know, they're probably the best in, in terms of any marine activities. They know mm -hmm. how to control boats. They know how to 
rescue people, uh, place them, land them on the beach, all the rest of it. Whereas if you sent members of the public, like the famous Dan- Dunkirk, you know, um, campaign, it would be a nightmare. You just wouldn't, it mm. wouldn't be allowed. Whereas the Navy have got the ability and the skill and the, the nation behind them, for God's sake. And I think we just need to get on with it. At least if we had a national petition, we would be able to get the nation behind it and it would show us, most of us, that we've got some say in the matter. And it might be mm. progress. You know, it might be progress. So, so that's a, well, that's works. interesting. I mean, I think you're right in some ways that people feel that it's so out of their own control. Frustration. Yeah. It is. And that, completely out of control. And it's Sorry. so interesting when John Curtis said that um, migration is not a huge political issue. I don't agree. I think, I think, I think it's a massive Sorry, issue. It's huge. I think Let's so. I, it, particularly in Kent. Particularly in Kent. Yeah. Christopher, thank you so much for thank your call you. uh, this morning. I want to move on uh, now and talk about identity theft because this is something that happened to me. I managed to get get back to my home after a very long time and I found all these letters, right? And um, someone had impersonated me. They'd opened all these store cards. They'd actually rung up debts, like hundreds mm-hmm. and hundreds of pounds worth of debts. I found clothes that had been delivered that I didn't order. Uh, they'd opened uh, credit cards. Uh, all under my name, they got my name right, my address, they'd got my date of birth right. And um, and I actually went and had a look at this in terms of the amount of money being uh, defrauded. So, so this is the other bizarre thing, right? So this happened to me. I then phoned them all up and said, look, I didn't actually mm. order any of these things. And they said, well, you have to prove it. Yeah, I know. And I was like, what? So then I have to phone the police and get a crime reference number. Then I have to go back to them and say, here's the crime reference number. So I had to do all the running. Then I have to arrange the return of all the goods. Oh, David. And it was nothing to do with David, me. David, I had my handbag stolen and they used my driving licence to go into shops and open phone contracts and some of the phone companies could not be convinced that I didn't do it. I could phone the people and speak to them who had my phones that I was being billed for. The police weren't interested in the banks. So interested. when I phoned them and I said right this is me and they said tell me your address and they said no this is the wrong address tell us the address up north and I went I don't live up north and that was the address of the person who'd taken out the account but they wouldn't then talk to me about the account because it was the wrong address. I was going I was pulling my hair out uh, and as a result of this I went to have a look at this over 1.2 billion pounds was stolen by criminals through authorised and unauthorised fraud in 2022. That is over £2,300 every single uh, Mm -hmm. minute. And of course, uh, identity theft and identity fraud uh, occurs a great deal. Well, joining us now is Tony Sells, who's co-founder of We Fight Fraud. Good morning to you. Morning, David. Morning. Hopefully, Morning. hopefully you heard my story there. I was, I'm not kidding, mm. I was apoplexy. I spent two hours trying to sort it out. Then the delivery company didn't even pick up the goods that I was trying to return. Did you like them? No, I didn't like them. Um, but this is common, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's something that happens all the time, you know. We've still not got a actual crime for identity theft here in the UK. So it's very difficult to disseminate all the information that can be lost or you know like your the person in the uh, studio with you just said you know she had a, a handbag stolen when something like that happens there's so much information in a handbag uh that can allow people to get steal identities right so we've all got to start understanding just a little bit more about how valuable our identities are now i don't know your circumstances david but what i do know is is that most of us put so much information out there online that someone like me can come along and understand how you know the threat landscape looks and gather all of the open source information mm. out there uh, that would allow me to uh, attack you, you know and steal your identity so mm. But you it's, see, it's so, a real issue. Well, it is, and of course, I was subject to a data breach through one of the many airlines. Actually, you know, when they had that mm. data breach, of course, they nicked all yeah. my information. What you said is fascinating. So I reported this to Action Fraud, and then I got a letter back from Action Fraud, essentially saying what you have said: uh, the use yeah. of. Um, uh, the use of another person's identity, referred to as identity theft, is not a police recordable yeah. crime. There is nothing yeah. I can do. Yeah, there's not. Yeah, because it's such a. So look, if someone uses your identity, right, and you're the police looking to charge that person, how do you charge someone when they may have used a driving license? So that's using uh, uh, an implement for fraud, right? So that's not an identity theft as such, because that 
uh, charge doesn't exist because there's so many different crimes that take place within an identity theft, like fraud. You know, the getting of the mobile phone contract is impersonation and fraud. Yeah, it's creating a contract. So it's like it gets really complicated mm -hmm. and we we still haven't worked it out of how to how to do it, you know. Um, but reports like that to action fraud are what gets stuff done in the future, David. That's what it's all about, you know. So, so that's why that's why I did it. I reported it to CFAS as well. Do you want to explain what CFAS is? Do you, do you know? Yeah, so they're, yeah. The, they're the UK's fraud prevention agency. Yeah, so they're kind of like a really good agency in the background that um, if you do get caught in uh, one of these identity thefts, you can uh, contact them and they can monitor your credit file for you. Uh, and tell you what's happened on it, yeah. And it, like it's the first report, uh, reporting services. It's uh, it's a, uh, an association run by the banks. And so, so it's actually a really good. Uh, and one. and you're right. So in terms of my credit score, because they took out a search every single card every time they yeah. bought some horrible jumpers and so on, my credit score keeps dropping. So it's now really low. Yeah. I, I, Unfortunately, that so every time, just like all of us, even if we do multiple credit checks, our credit score is going to drop. What criminals do is when they steal an identity, identity, they do multiple checks in one hit. You know, in a day you could get six, ten, fifteen checks. And now, because of the need for us all to buy stuff so quickly online, you have a lot of companies that offer finance online and you can get instantly approved mm. right so it's just literally a tick button online that you have to go through and uh, i know the government have been looking into regulating that much harder which will also help the impact of identity theft so i was also reading a, a story this morning which is in the telegraph in the past four months shell companies have been sprouting like weeds in the neatly kept homes of henry drive now this is basically where one drive has a particular postcode and basically what's happened is is, uh, there are lots of companies being set up in people's names who live in that poor road and they're being set up by places like in China and in Russia they're getting loans from the banks and the first that people know about this is when a letter drops through from companies house saying thank you very much for registering your company which they didn't do they then get sent a plethora of documents on the back of it is there anything that you can do to stop this uh, yeah I mean we have to get better at companies house at how we open businesses you know because of it's very easy to open a business with documentation or without documentation in some instances, right? And that is a massive loophole that fraudsters for however long it's been around for have been abusing it. Uh, and, and it's great work by uh, Graham Barrow there exposing that stuff uh, and bringing that out there in that way. And uh, I've just had a message from Mick saying ID theft is a major crime and police unilaterally decided to decriminalise it. Another massive mistake by police chiefs who are never held to account. Action fraud is a small office in the city covering the whole country with no staff. Just in terms of that, so there's a difference between having identity theft, which is what happened to me, and then fraud is what you're saying later on. Yeah, so they're different crimes, you know. Like, someone could impersonate you and steal your identity and never commit a fraud against you david but they could be wandering around pretending to be you yeah so that's a fraud but they've never actually committed a financial fraud yeah that so that's where it gets if you think about all of these things that go into someone committing a fraud in someone's name there's a whole load of other charges and it's the charge ramp up mm. that um you know, gets the fraudster longer in prison, really. That's why they probably did it in the beginning. I mean, I'm no expert on that, but I assume that's why they would have done it. Um, now, you know, we do need to get to a place where identity theft needs to become a charge. I don't know how they'll do it, but what I do know is there's a lot of rule changes and a lot more stringent stuff coming from the government and the police on this because it's such a serious subject that they all want to tackle. So, so finally, if I may, what advice would you give to people? I mean, I thought I was pretty careful, but obviously not careful enough. Yeah, I mean, firstly, so you, like you said, you got caught in a data breach, right? So there is a really good website called Have I Been Pwned, yeah? P-W-N-D, yeah? Um, you can go to that website, put in your email address, and it will tell you if your email has been compromised in a attack or a, a ransomware attack normally or a database breach, yeah? Um, that should be your first port of call. If you have, you can find out what database it was in, go to that 
company that it was so you found out it was a, a, a an airline attack go to that airline and change your passwords or delete the app delete your information from them whatever it is you want to do withdraw your information from them and you just need to be more careful with the information that we have so always use password managers yeah oh really um yeah when you're going online i mean like look it's like having a wallet yeah if you have all your debit or credit cards and your cash all in your pockets when you're going down the road the likelihood is, is that you're going to lose some bits if you've got a wallet it's all in one place yes if you lose the wallet um you lose everything in one hit but it's also much easier to go back and know that everything was there so in a password manager all your emails are there. If you was to lose access to it, good password managers always have great contact centers and proof of who you are, yeah? So there's lots of stuff. Always use multi-factor authentication, yeah? Um, whenever you're doing stuff with accounts, yeah? Um, they're really important. Never go to gateways that are not trusted. So if you're using an eBay, a marketplace, somewhere like that, uh, you know, don't get taken outside of the gateways that they provide for you to pay would be my advice on that. And just keep your data as safe as you can. Uh, it's really good advice. Dr. Rennie looked at me like, you're, are you, do you know what? I, I've, apparently my email has been pawned in eight data breaches. There you go. And do you there know you about a password manager? Do you know how that I works? had a password manager and then I lost the... But you um, see, I don't really understand I them. had one and then I lost the actual um, password. password and then I couldn't <laughs> find the very long 42-digit code they'd given me in case that ever happened and I gave up. I mean, so, so again, doesn't this go back to the whole problem, Tony, is that it's becoming so so complicated and and I, I've tried it I gave up because I didn't like them but obviously I need to make sure I do use a, a password manager yeah I mean you, you definitely but also what you should be doing as well yeah it's really simple to just go online use a search engine mm. and just search for what should I do how do I download a password manager or use a password manager you know, it will tell you very simply how to do it yeah <laughs> these things are there for us to use so yeah. Brilliant, brilliant advice. Thank you so much, Tony. That's Thank Tony you. Sales, their co-founder of We Fight Fraud. It's extraordinary. But it, what but what I was so annoyed about is the amount of time it took me, the fact yeah. is that I had And that to they're know. really not interested. No one's interested. Exactly. That's the thing. I could speak to the people who were owning the phones that I was paying for, and the police could have dialed those numbers in a second. Yeah, but no one wants to, do they? Um, Interesting. Good morning, doctors. Lovely dress, Rene. Thank you. Lovely dress. I think we match, actually, this morning. We could easily stop identity theft with digital IDs, couldn't we? Funny how the authorities don't seem bothered to sort it out. Ooh, that's not a road I want to go down. Oh, because people were fake IDs, so we, we couldn't. No. Uh, lots of other messages uh, coming in as well. Keep those coming in. In terms of caricatures, let me know your thoughts on politicians or any, indeed anyone else that you I've want I've got to. one. Have you? Ed Davis, Mr Dopey. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Mr. Men and Little Miss books. I think they're rather marvellous. Uh, right, let's, let's take a break. Uh, after the break, we'll be talking about um, the, the fact that actually young boys need masculine role models. I think this is a really important topic. Uh, joining us after the break is Ken Jolivet, who's author of the brilliant Bob Books for Boys. This is Talk TV. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored, in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think there's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Stop working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. You believe you can win this war? He's making me cry again. They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award-winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. We need accountability. We need performance in all walks of life. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a board, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales. Ghislaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. Donald Trump has just said he expects to be arrested at 7.30 p.m. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Yes. Labour has 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, no, of the no, polls. No, no. Can we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs, and they bent the rules, or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? 
There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll. If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now, you're probably going to boot me off the short <laughs> end. Let's go. Oh, Get her out. Get her out. Mark. Mark. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? <laughs> <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That was a joke. Welcome back to Weekend Breakfast. Sorry, I was reading all of the uh, messages that uh, are coming in uh, about uh, identity fraud happening to many of you around uh, the country. We'll talk in the, about that in just a, a minute as well. Uh, lots of messages as well. David and Rene, I never use my real date of birth in the cyber world, except for government databases. This helps preserve my genuine identity, which I can prove with my birth certificate. Plus, it means I can be a bit younger than I am in reality. Uh, well said, Michelle, in Worcestershire. I'm not sure I agree that you just change your date of birth to suit yourself. I, I wouldn't remember it. I wouldn't <laughs> remember the date of birth. But you know these things about the password manager as well. I wouldn't remember the password. To get into well, the that's password. what happened to me. Yeah. And then I couldn't find the special code they've given me <laughs> should that ever happen. No, so I, I write down the passwords because I can't remember any of them. But then, of course, then you can have a data breach and then they get all of your uh, passwords. Uh, so many, many messages coming in on this. It's really hit a nerve. Gary and Sheffield. Good morning, both. Many companies who get hacked don't even know they have been hacked. Mm. Smaller companies and even some big ones don't use effective encryption of their data. So unless they really need to know your name, e-mother's maiden name, uh, emails, mother's maiden name, all that stuff. Just give false details. I'd have to write them down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeremy Corbyn, I've been asking about caricatures as well. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn is Wolfie from Tooting Popular Front. That's a good one. And Ed Balls, Benny Hill. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, no, he's not as exciting or interesting as no, Benny Hill. No, he isn't. You're right. Uh, right, let's talk about young men in society. And this is a really interesting topic. Rene sent this to me. And, of course, there, there is very much a new world out there. And, and I do wonder about role models and the lack of them for young men. And we see within young men in society uh, disenchantment with education, lack of motivation towards work, um, also not really having any goals in life, uh, opting out of the workforce, self-imposed social isolation, also excessive video game use, excessive porn use and so on. And young men, it seems to me, are at best not valued, I think at worst they're demonised in society and I think we've ignored young men for far too long and I think there are very mixed messages in society about young men and, and role models and in many families there aren't men to be role models for uh, these young men growing up. And so that's why I want to introduce you to Ken Jolivet, who is author of the brilliant Bob Books for Boys. And he joins us now. Good morning to you. Good morning, uh, David. Good morning. And uh, really good to see you. Um, just talk about the problem out there. It strikes me, Rene and I have spoken about this before, that, that young men are increasingly ignored. They're lost. They're disenfranchised. They don't have role models. And I think this is a growing and, and very serious problem. Well, besides fatherlessness, which is well documented by several doctors, Warren Farrell being one of them with the boy crisis, 
It all stems down to reading. So boys read less than girls and they lead, uh, read less well than girls. So the gap starts really early from about age seven and it just gets wider and wider. And why is that? Well, boys, more than half boys tend to find reading boring. They also find it a bit girly and they're too busy. They prefer to conquer the world and do other things. So um, then on the institutional side of things, everything's become a bit feminized. So you've got feminized teachers in a sense that the majority are females. You also have feminized schools, feminized material, and feminized methods. <clears throat> so all these things uh, dissuade boys from reading and they also get placed into good and bad sections. Like you've got your good readers and your bad readers. And once you're placed in, into the bad group, you're probably not gonna recover. And so the gap just widens more and more. So we have to find a way to teach our boys how to read. So they need to read books that they like to read. Mm -hmm. And one of those things is we have to inspire them. We have to appeal to their interests. We have to appeal to their taste, give them books that they want to read. And one way we have to do that is by redefining the definition of what reading is. Boys don't like to read the kind of books that girls like to read. You know, they like in, uh, things like the Guinness Book of World Records, mm. things in snippets, science journals, comic books, this kind of thing. So any reading is good reading, and we need to give them mentors and role models so that they can bond with, and who better to be reading with than their father, and that's what these books are for, so they can read bedtime stories and talk about masculinity and what it's done for the, for the man himself, and they can relate together and bond while they're reading. And... Um, yeah, so that's that's the why we have a problem. And the way to fix it is through these books, because these are the books that give everyday adventures uh, that boys can relate to. You know, the illustrations are appealing to the boys and girls. Of course, they, they there are plenty of girls reading these books. <clears throat> but these are the kind of things that benefit boys because we're talking about masculinity. Indeed. And Indeed. And you, you wrote these books. Um, they, they obviously centre around, and we saw them there, a, a chap called Brilliant Bob. Brilliant Bob. And he has three best friends. Dazzling Dave, obviously, Genuine George, and Superboy Sam. So, so just talk us through. So when, they, when the kids read these... You, you talk about the fact they appeal to them because they're cartoon. Like I remember when I was growing up, I absolutely love cartoons of all descriptions. And, and, and I think you're absolutely right about boys dipping in and dipping out and wanting to know things and wanting to know facts and, and that kind of stuff. So, so how did you come about coming up with this end product? Well, it was like everything. It's a stepping stone. You start off with one thing, writing about one thing, and then you get to the others. And it was male suicide. And um, I thought, well, how can I help boys, young boys? And I thought, well, the only way to, and help men, sorry, with the suicide thing. And I thought, well, to help men, you gotta start with boys. And I thought about the Jesuits who said, give me the boy to the age of seven and I'll give you the man. So I thought, right, okay, toxic masculinity is, you know, and masculinity in general is being attacked from every mm. angle <laughs> with the APA in America, Gillette commercials, just everything about toxic masculinity. And let's face it, no, there's nothing toxic about masculinity, just like there's nothing toxic about femininity. So it's just good and bad, and that's what we need to focus on. And I've coined the phrase ace. We need to affirm masculinity, we need to claim masculinity and celebrate it, and we also need to embrace masculinity. And these books are gonna allow fathers and the significant male, if they don't have a father in their life, to talk about these subjects and mm. you know i coined the phrase you know brilliant bob dazzling day superboy that just a little catchy thing to you know boys like superheroes and mm. one in one of the books it's the wolfman in um in one of the series in brilliant bob is brave so <laughs> it's everyday everyday adventures that boys can relate to and it brings in masculinity so it the, the main thing is to improve their mental health self-esteem mm. sense of well-being and male identity, because this is really important. It, it certainly is, and, and just in terms of that, you know, I, I like that brilliant Bob is brave. And, and, the, and it focuses around brave, being competitive, being strong, being curious, being sensible risk takers, stoic and persistent. Dr. Rene, I know, I know you think this is also a brilliant idea. I do, and I've had a chat with um, Ken. Good morning. Um, Good for morning, me, 
for me, I mean, Ken actually challenged me on me supporting women in things. And Quite that right. was the right thing to do. And that was how we got talking. But I think that boys now are being told that all of these things, brave, persistent, you know, competitive, are bad. And we need to actually mm. turn that coin over and say they're not bad. In a positive way, it's great to be brave. It's great to be, you know, a superhero. It's great to do all of the things that we know are masculine. It's fine for girls to do them too. Mm. But it's fine for boys to be brave and not be ashamed of those things and I think we've reached a point where boys are ashamed and confused so that's what attracted me to Bob's mm. brilliant books. I, I also think that, that boys are very lost indeed and also they, they have this conflicting messaging the whole time about what they are allowed to do, how they can show their emotions, whether they have to be stoical and, and, I, and that resonance for me about just feeling lost and then immersing yourself in video games because you have you have no aspiration. Well, yeah, let me uh, just touch on one thing about what Renee was saying. I was actually given a letter from one of the fathers who read the books to their son. Uh, he had two young sons, single dad, which is one of the rarities, but he read Brilliant Bob is Competitive <clears throat> to his son, nine years old. And this boy, he had no relationship with this uh, boy for a, quite a long time. And when he read Competitive, Brilliant Bob is Competitive, the boy just changed on the spot all of a sudden he felt understood he had that burning desire in his soul to be competitive and he was squashed at school and his dad told me how all of a sudden this boy loved his father connected with him he felt understood and he wanted to walk to school with his uh, father and his other son so that's the power of these books mm -hmm. and i never knew it would hit that hard and i had a grandfather do the same thing told me how he related, he grew up with uh, three women in, in his household, his mother and two aunts, and he was feminized and he felt squashed about his competitive nature. So some really good reviews from people that it's really uh, hitting home for some people. And the other thing is about the feminism that, you know, the teachers, they're taught the feminist dogma that it leaves them resistant to teaching boys the way that boys need to be taught. Mm. Um, they only see things through female eyes. And so we have to see that boys are different and they need to be taught differently than girls. And that's what we need to do with this feminized education system. Mm. We need to make it cater it for the boys. Um, male mo role models and people, they need to see men reading. Mm. And that's what they don't get. Mm. So many messages coming in. Uh, excellent, Ken. Well said. Dan says, unfortunately, doctors, I grew up with grandparents who fought two world wars and learnt respect from the tales of bravery for our freedom. Those voices are now gone. Hi, doctors. This guy says Simon is talking sense. There is no such thing as toxic masculinity. It's a myth. And this one from Kirsten says, the, the, where can we get these books? They are brilliant. I see the difference coming from a different country and a different culture. Well, like most things, it's on Amazon. So amazon.com, .co, .uk, .ca, um, obviously in Australia, these are the majority countries where the books are selling. And I've sold some in Spain and Germany, but Amazon, you can also order them. If you have the ISBN, which are there, you just go to my website. You can get, you can click right to the Amazon site from there. What's the um, and ISBNs, you can order them at any bookstore and they mm. do come in hardbacks for those who want to spend a bit more for a collectible sort of durable version. The paperbacks are very affordable and nice. They even have a probably better picture quality. And then you have ebooks even. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's 20 percent of the market apparently so um, <laughs> Rene won't we, remember the yeah. password to buy those. Um, and where yes. it, what is your website, Ken? So it's uh, brilliantbobkidbooks.com. Brilliant. I, I think you're doing a fantastic job, Ken. Uh, I look forward to going out and buying a, a brilliant Bob book. I'll put them uh, on my Twitter. I'll put the address. Oh, brilliant. Yes, Twitter. fantastic. Do. Uh, and Ken, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. That's Ken Jolivet, who is thank author you. of the Brilliant Bob books for boys. Um, lots of messages as well. Leighton says, when we were kids, we were brought up on westerns, Viking films, war films. We read books like Treasure Island. These were our heroes. That is very true. It really is. We need to look after our boys as much as we need to look after our girls. So I was obsessed with westerns at the time. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and Treasure Island. I love Treasure Island. And they used to do, there was a black and white, well, it shows how old I am, but black and white Robinson Crusoe, which I was obsessed by. But, you know, obviously he was on the island and then he fought for himself 
Balvenie. So interesting, Alice is doing a stage academy and this Treasure Island is actually their theme for this term, but she also loves superheroes. That's so great. these books are for all children. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I, I was very struck by what he said, boys and girls are different and need to be taught differently yeah. and they have different needs and that's very clear as well, I think. Uh, let's move on now uh, and welcome Steve Denyer, who is a Virgin Radio presenter. Um, we have some breaking news this morning or something that's been rumbling on overnight. I thought it was important that you you tell us the latest uh, for those people who are waking up who who will start to hear rumours of what's going on. Mm, this is a story that's been breaking overnight and is set to be really big later on today and to, you know, o overshadow the news agenda. Russell Brand has made a statement this morning uh, denying serious, disturbing, criminal allegations and has insisted that all his relationships were always consensual. Now, this follows a Sunday Times investigation that we will read about tomorrow and a television show, Dispatches Special, which airs on Channel 4 tonight at 9 o'clock. And last night, lots of people, there was a lot of uh, speculation as to what this show was about, mm. who was going to be featured in it. Because the reason for that is that it was in the TV listings and it says Dispatches Special, but there was nothing in there. Nothing on which it. Which is highly unusual. And then um, a statement last night on Twitter about the investigation that we're going to learn. So apparently this afternoon at 3 o'clock, we will find out more information. If I may, mm. I just want to play you a statement that Russell Brand put out to his millions of followers around the world on YouTube. Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Now, this isn't the usual type of video we make on this channel where we critique, attack and undermine the news in all its corruption, because in this story, I am the news. I've received two extremely disturbing letters, or a letter and an email, one from a mainstream media TV company, one from a newspaper listing a litany of extremely egregious and aggressive attacks, as well as some pretty stupid stuff, like uh, my community festival should be stopped, that I shouldn't be able to attack mainstream media narratives on this channel. But amidst this litany of astonishing, rather baroque attacks are some very serious allegations that I absolutely refute. These allegations pertain to the time when I was working in the mainstream, when I was in the newspapers all the time, when I was in the movies, and as I've written about extensively in my books, I was very, very promiscuous. Now, during that time of promiscuity, the relationships I had were absolutely always consensual. I was always transparent about that then, almost too transparent. Right. So, so that's his statement which he issued and as you say he has millions of followers. You say we will learn more at three o'clock. This was bubbling overnight. Uh, yes. A lot of speculation as well and it can, clearly he wants to be on the front foot and, and has come out um, fighting. And what's interesting is obviously we've had a few high profile stories this summer of people being accused of abusing their power. You could say almost that the media is now shining a light on itself. It'd be interesting to see what these allegations are as I say, massive investigation with the Sunday Times. And tonight at 9 o'clock, Channel 4 has cleared its schedule for this show. It's an hour and a half show at 9 o'clock. So we will learn later on today on Talk TV exactly what these allegations are as they drip free feed from about 3 o'clock this afternoon. Steve, Steve, thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's take a break now. After the break, Steve will be back because it is time for, uh, because it's Saturday, for Denya's Delights. This is Talk TV.
Welcome back to oh, the final part of Weekend Breakfast here on Talk TV. The time, 9.45 now on Saturday, September the 16th. The wife's in. Uh, we were talking about young boys needing role models. Uh, this says uh, from Linda in Somerset. Good morning to you, Linda. Uh, hi, Dave and Ren. A great interview about brilliant boys. My teenage son is worried about going to school as his teacher is now so uh, non-gender specific and is frightened he will use the wrong pronouns. Oh, my God. How can boys learn if they have no male role models? non-gender specific mm. this is the nonsense that our children are experiencing at school when they should just be learning how to be good humans mm. who can be productive in the world oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what I don't honestly know what's happened and but um, have a look at those books actually I think they're uh, very very good very good indeed by the way my nephew Cameron calls himself Bob so he will like that brilliant Bob he will, just say, he will and he is a little terror takes <laughs> after his uncle right it's time for Denya's delights Denya's delights there you go, all oh, smiley now. happy Saturday, everybody. Uh, happy Saturday to you. Look at the sun. It's beautiful shining morning, across isn't it? the capital city. Beautiful morning. Now, listen, guys, mm. you know the COVID lockdowns and all that time we had to spend with each other a few years ago, it tested a lot of people's patience, didn't it? It did. And Indeed. it's interesting, we've got an announcement this morning that Hugh Jackman is to split with his wife, uh, Deborah Lee Furness, after 27 years. And the reason it is, they're putting it down to the lockdown period, and just that, you know, if you read between the lines... They got to know each other. Each well, they other. actually had to spend, <laughs> spend too much time together. And they were it's like, what this story just, shouts. Don't actually really like you know, lots of us had a difficult time, and I think lots mm. of people are probably nodding right now, watching TV, <laughs> listening to the radio, thinking, tell me about the it. Men sitting in sheds around the country. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's interesting, isn't it? They're blaming that. They're blaming the Hollywood writers' strike as well, because there were a lot of actors. Mm. And, you know, you and I have spoken about this matter for months now. We've been pretty yeah. much out of work yeah. and not earning anything and it's fine if you're you know a multi-million dollar actor like tom cruise but not so good if you're a you know a working actor no, trying indeed. to make ends meet really really hard for them actually Sad. it is and, and actually with with the strikes there's no end in sight i mean it could rumble on we're looking at the strikes of potentially affecting yeah, the oscars so, next so, year so where are we in that year. because this was all about ai taking over the jobs and of course there has been sort of uh, uniformity or unanimity of everyone across the board saying they are supporting these actors. I feel very sorry for them. Any any sense of a breakthrough? This is the disturbing thing. Absolutely nothing. And I spoke to uh, a couple of people the other week at a big festival I was at and a couple of actors who were there. And actually, I've, I've interviewed a couple of directors but had to do the interviews uh, in, in quiet because they can't be seen to pr be promoting mm. stuff. But they've all said it will last as long as... As, as it, it needs lasts. to last and it could be months it could be years but we are rumbling towards and uh, i suppose movie it, ultimately it will hit the studios in the pocket because if they're not making movies they can't actually cash in on that yeah exactly exactly that and billy porter recently was said that he had to downsize his apartment so already he hasn't been paid for a movie that he started working on uh, he can't be seen to be doing any work either so it's a really tough time really for a lot tough. of these people and particularly tough if you're trying to make it if you've kind of, of you know if but you, you said see, my and, life is you know people and... kids move to LA for example because they they have that first bite at the cherry and they put everything into it they already have no money and they they they're so desperate to get on you'll do anything won't yeah, you yeah exactly so imagine if you just haven't got that opportunity do you, you haven't know got the, the way the ladder. Mm, it, exactly no, that yeah, i mean it's, it's really interesting difficult. isn't it we've all been affected by the covid thing but these relationships obviously you know if they weren't working in the first place are certainly not going to work if you've been locked down with each no, other for no. a few months indeed um can i take you to the theater yes please abigail's <laughs> party have you guys ever seen this no. it's a mike Lee oh play. i know it really well you know well yeah. so, what do you so i saw it last night it's, it's very funny it's with... very clever isn't it it's all based in the 70s with flock wallpaper and um what what says what's shirts what's... like yours thank you shirts like mine what, <laughs> what... that was the wallpaper wasn't there the Depot on, theater, I'm, just, I'm just remembering back wasn't there an undertone to this it's actually quite macabre it's underneath it's really dark yeah it's really so my two-word review, deliciously disturbing. Mm. That's what I thought on the train home last night. She has just... a, basically, she has a party, doesn't she? Tony, that's it. Tony, and, Tony. and Beverly, isn't it? Yeah, and there's but, Sue. What does she say? She always offers 
it's not a volivant. I can't remember what it is. There's like cheese on cheese, um, cheese and pineapple, which was obviously very <laughs> seventy. I love cheese and pineapple, but um, but underneath it there is a much darker side. Oh, it really is. And the last five minutes, you're thinking this is actually quite. <laughs> I'm quite disturbed now. Mm. And um, it started off with people laughing. By the end, it's silent as people left. Mm. But it's on in Finchley tonight, and it's great. And it's twenty pounds, and the actors are great. And it's only on for three evenings. So if you're around London tonight, tonight is the final Sounds performance brilliant. of that. Um, um, can I take you to television tonight? Yeah. Love Actually. It's nothing like thinking about Christmas in September. Um, <laughs> do you know what I love about Love Actually? Do you remember the first two minutes of Love Actually that's filmed at the airports? Yes. Genuine airport, Heathrow yeah. airport footage of loved ones greasing each other, saying goodbye mm. to one another. Um, the guy who, Andrew Lincoln, wrote all those billboards himself, you know, the guy who's kind of chucking up all the billboards halfway through. There are, there's so many great facts about this movie. It's three hours long. It starts at nine o'clock tonight on Channel 5. It does kind of, it kind of makes you feel good. It we, does. We won't be it watching does. that. No, we won't. We, uh, we'll be in bed. Um, <laughs> we have a divas night. Well, no, hang on a minute. I was just oh, going to go, go back on. to that go because on. it is such a brilliant film, and they, it's multi-layered. That's what I love about that film, and and everything is so beautifully crafted. Yeah, and I love the bit at the beginning. So you've got the Heathrow Airport footage of people mm. saying hello to each other and stuff, and the beginning bit talks about nine eleven, and it says that those people in the tower, no one, you know, those people faced with the most unbearable yeah. situation. Everybody made phone calls full of love, yeah. telling people. People, I loved, I love you, yes, you know, and it's really, really powerful um, and a great film, and also really funny as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, divas talking. Divas. Which, talking not, this is not an evening <laughs> with us two, uh, but in fact, but it could be. <laughs> it could be. It'd be very good. Lots of people are watching. Uh, Rihanna, Alicia Keys tonight, Britney Spears, all on BBC oh. Two from nine o'clock, and then they go and play Desperately Seeking Susan, the Madonna movie from 1984. Did you like that? I think it's an interesting movie that spawned millions of girls with a role model, a Madonna mm. role model. People dressed up. There was the Madonna look. Now, apparently, they had to fight to get Madonna in this movie. They were going to cast, I think it was Di Diane Keaton, Goldie Horn. originally. They couldn't find the right people for the movie. And somebody said, look, there's this girl. We think she's going to be big. <laughs> Take a chance on her. By the time Desperately Seeking Susan came out, Into the Groove got in the charts. And by the time it was was out and it was big. Madonna was a worldwide yeah. star. So it's great to watch it and, and to find out that's where it all started, this 40 I mean, for, for younger people, of course, Madonna's story is in it itself mm. is an incredible rise to fame. Oh, she's yes. a rebel, isn't she? She yeah. was always a rebel. She managed to upset just about everybody from the Pope, I think. <laughs> three, two, yeah. Well, you know, it was everyone, wasn't it? Was it? Everyone. But also, there was nobody else around it, uh, around at that time like her. So she was out there on her own. You know, you could say now you've got your Lady Gaga's yeah, and Rihanna's and your Beyonce. Her. Everyone's followed mm. her, but in the 80s, she was doing it all by herself. She and she she wasn't just one step ahead of everybody else. She mm. was a couple of steps, you know. Mm. Vogue was something that she yeah. brought to the masses. You and even suddenly... think about things like Papa Don't Preach, mm. tackling subjects that so, so many teenage girls have had to tackle, tackle with their dad mm. and having to have that conversation. Mm. You know, she just went there. That's right, the, li the lines, I'm keeping the baby. Mm. I remember, yeah. I know you're really going to I know you're gonna be disappointed. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, Madonna, I think she's one of those incredible icons actually and I think you're right not even two steps ahead way ahead she yeah. changed the whole landscape didn't she, she did and for a good decade it was her and it was just her can I quickly mention Graham Norton's back on Virgin Radio uh, he's been away for a few weeks he's back this morning we're going to play if I may we're just going to show you um, a little gig that we had last night right here at the top of the tower over the other side of the building Texas where was the invite performed I didn't go oh. I was at Abigail's party trying to review it for you uh, but Texas performed live Charlene Spateri was Building. In this building, we invited about a hundred Virgin Radio listeners to come to a sunset session. <clears throat> We've done it with Busted. Uh, we did it um, with the brilliant Suede at the end of last year. In a couple of years, a couple of weeks' time, we've got Natalie and Brulia coming in as well. Um, so anyway, you're Are here. Are we going to that? <laughs> Should we go? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll sort it. I'll have a little chat. Oh, um, so be, you'll hear these Texas Friday, tracks from last go. night with Graham. Right, let's have a look. Say. 
So, yeah, so here we are. This is a video I wanted to play you. So little bits and pieces of Charlie Terry rocking up at the top of the news tower. This is what it looked like before the 100 people turned up and the 100 people turning up now. And it was really special, apparently. The sun was setting just behind Charlene Spiteri's head as she started with her first song. She did Black Eyed Boy, oh, Say like What that. You Want, the new song. I mean, here's a band, guys. They've been going for 40 years, 10 albums. They can fill stadiums around the world. And this is probably one of the, the kind of smallest gigs she's done since she was a wannabe hairdresser in Glasgow. So <laughs> a really special <laughs> evening last night. But we will do Natty and Brilliant in a couple of weeks. And you can hear Texas on with Graham uh, between now and 12.30 over on Virgin Radio. Fantastic. And I will just say Graham Norton returns to Virgin Radio this weekend with a litany of amazing guests, uh, including the hot priest Andrew Scott, who will be talking about his new West End stage adaptation of Vanya. So you can join Graham Norton, not till this programme is over, obviously. <laughs> Uh, either via the app, the website, virginradio.co.uk. You can also listen on DAB. Steve Denyer, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And a delight. Always, always a, a great pleasure indeed. And that was today's uh, Denyer's Delight. Denyer's Delight. Lots of messages, as you would expect. Judy in Norfolk, uh, near my home county of Suffolk. Good morning, David and Rennie. I'm loving your show as always. Do you suppose our government have even considered how millions of air source heat pumps are going to become available by 2030? Are they going to appear from nowhere? And how many plumbers will be required to train to fit them? My guess is they will be manufactured in China. What right does this government think they have to inflict such cost and chaos on our lives and the big question is for what <laughs> sorry i know that was peter carwell who you really aren't very good at ducking are you good morning I mean, well peter. i try to do it the other way around where you sort of you sort of you don't duck under it but you kind of go to the it's on your right and then you I don't we know. need to no. practice we, we really practice so we'll practice that later shall we good morning good okay morning. yes what um, do you mean okay <laughs> yeah no that, that, but i'm up for that no, i'll give you a no, shot so get your I people to talk to my people right when i say good morning good you, morning good morning there we go yes, yes hello good, good morning renee good morning. <laughs> yes wonderful to see you uh, right so uh, you're you're up next um so yeah. Busy show? Busy show. The war on the motorist. Uh, 20 mile an hour limits being imposed by Labour. That's what the Conservatives say. It's certainly happened in Wales anyway. We're also having a big debate about the pensions triple lock. We've got Dennis Reid, who's the director of Silver Voices, uh, and uh, Reem Abraham, who's in her 20s. We want to talk about <laughs> we this. We know Reem. Yeah. I mean, you know, is it is it logical? Is it uh, fair to have a triple lock on the pensions, especially when people are paying I mean, it's, for it? it's a really interesting one. Both major parties rowing back on it. Yeah. I think they can see... I mean, they're very. It's very difficult. I've said to you before that I think the Conservatives would be would be, you know, it's a tricky one for them. It's very tricky. Dominic um, Cummins has, has yeah. come in this week. Well, he it, see, yeah, absolutely. He says it's the last sort of bit of the coalition around Brexit that uh, the Conservatives haven't attacked. So mm. um, he says it's a really mm. stupid idea. We're also talking about conversion therapy. The government's ruled back on that as well. We'll have a big debate about that as well. Dangerous dogs. Hunter Biden as well. Not mm. enough. Definitely not enough. Uh, people uh, talking about that. So we'll get into the get into all of that. Taking everybody's calls as well. And of course, your favourite, David, <laughs> Cat of the Week. <laughs> it's still going. It's still, it's, what do you mean? What do you mean?